the areas from edition 2021, uh, in the name of the whole organization committee for this role, we're very happy to see you today, but it is maybe about two months later than initially planned, but it's good to be able to be together in a room and uh, talk about research being done at API. So before we start the program today, a bit of information maybe related to health and safety. This is the map of the venue. You should know that we're here at the center in the big um, auditorium. You also notice probably the posters on your way in, uh, just in front of the auditorium, so that's where the post will be. Food, uh, so morning and afternoon tea as well as lunch, will be served uh, in between the two uh, auditoria on the right when you exit this auditorium. And you have toilets on both sides of the auditorium. Now, in case of an emergency, which we hope won't happen, but if we need to leave uh, this auditorium, there are like a few exits, so here and here, or you can leave the doors from which you came in, and once you are in the hallway, you can exit both on the left uh, and on the right. Now, um, with the new risk banding of the University of Auckland, our event is an orange event, which means that we probably all will survive the day. But we also have an even compliant officer Amit here. So in case you have any concern rating health and safety, you can go to Amit or myself and we'll take care of it. Please um, yeah, use seats to not sit uh, in the stairs, of course, because of uh, possibility of evacuation. No food and drinks inside the auditorium, so you can have coffee and lunch outside, but don't bring anything inside. And also please silence your phones. Uh, out of respect to the speaker and the persons around you. Now, um, I won't go in detail um, over the program. You've seen it. It's posted uh, outside. If you want to the phone, um, there's a QR code here. It's also printed on the front outside. Uh, on your laptop, I send the program to a call ABI. And in case you don't have it, you can maybe send me a quick email and I can send it to you uh, later. But then you can follow the program and know when coffee is coming or when lunch is coming, or most importantly, when the interesting talks are happening. But we'll uh, briefly we'll start with Peter, who's going to give a state of the ABI. Um, and of course, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Institute, and we'll mark this by having a series of four talks kind of telling the story of ABI since its birth in 2001 to today. We also have uh, three keynote speakers. We we'll highlight uh, multidisciplinary collaboration within the API and also outside of the API. Um, as um, previous years, we have a few 19 three minute thesis presentations from PhD students, and we have uh, more than one hundred posters that you can uh, look at to have an overview of the research being done at API uh, during two poster sessions, and we finish today with uh, prizes and awards. Of course, uh, you are welcome. We encourage you to share your experience at the forum on your preferred social media platform. Don't forget the hashtag MPIRF21. And we will to the view. Uh, I will leave the floor to Peter, our director of Peter Frenchman, who is going to give uh, an overview of the state of the API. Prior to that, as a research 
key, but we moved up to the current building in 2001 and became a so-called faculty research institute, which sat under the engineering faculty. But then in 2008, became a separate um, large-scale research institute, like the Liggett Research is the only other one the university has. And that meant that we're no longer um, sitting within a faculty, we're sitting alongside the faculty. Liggett and the are um, regarded as large-scale research units beside the um, faculties. And the um, structure then is that we answer directly to the Vice Chancellor or in some cases through Jim Nixon, um, the other is through Jim Nixon. All that is actually changing a little bit under the new scheme and will be a, a promise who operates between the Vice Chancellor and the Deans um, and the RSRI directors and the, the new system that's coming in through the Vice Chancellor. But anyway, that's where we sit. And we have lots of interactions obviously with engineering in particular, but also with the Faculty of Science and the and information. Um, and, and of course the, the University Vice Chancellor is appointed by the Council, so the Council is the, the governing body of the University, um, and the Vice Chancellor is like the Chief Executive, and then the Deans and Director sit on that. Um, okay, and then we also this, last year really tidied up a little bit our administrative, administrative structures within the ABI, um, partly because the university was putting in place more um, process around some of these roles. So Andrew as Associate Director of Research and Alice as Associate Director of Postgrad, for example, were really established as part of the, the wish of the university to have three directors, associate directors sitting under the director and deputy director, one for research, one for postgrad, and one for academic. But the one for academic is not needed for an MSRI because it deals with undergraduate activities. So we have two of those positions, um, and also associate director Mole. And then we have um, an institute operations manager, and here, of course, strategic relationship manager, Guy, and a development manager, um, Nicole. Um, then, we decided last year at a retreat um, to really have a clearer view of the, the leadership and the strategic planning within the API. And we decided that the most appropriate strategic, and always these groups, you don't want them too big because they've got to operate effectively. Typically, it's about nine people. But um, we decided that all the API professors should be automatically part of that strategic planning group. And that's a group that meets very to just think about the directions that the ABI is going, what the opportunities are. Um, and then we have an academic group leadership. And this is where, this is really the most important group in my mind, because these are the people that really um, bring in the money, bring in the students, provide leadership for a particular area of research. We are a research institute. We've always got to be driven by that. Um, research and training, uh, graduate training goals. And what we wanted to do was to give clear leadership to people that within these, who lead these groups and are also responsible for career, um, for mentoring and for career progression for the, the various people in those groups. Um, so there'll be lots of other people contributing to any one of those groups. You can identify other people who would be providing um, real contribution to the group, but we needed to, and leadership group, but we needed to have one person who is really the line manager in an academic sense for mentoring and career progression for everyone in the, all the academic uh, academics in the area. So that, that's a, a set of groups that will change as we develop. We can imagine other, I mean already the brain group, for example, is rapidly growing in size and is likely to become one of these groups. It's really dependent on long-term sustainable research funding and students that clearly identify a major area of activity that the ABI um, has. Then, as many people here will be involved in these, we have these service committees that were really set up a few, quite recently, a few years ago, um, and I think they're operating extremely well. Um, these are service committees where people 
have a little group, typically sitting under them. Um, these are the leaders of those groups, uh, those committees. And that will change, that will rotate. Um, and it's really a, a now a very key part of the operation of the FBI to, to be thinking across all these different areas with people engaged in providing service contributions um, to the FBI through these committees. Um, and as everyone here, I think, appreciates how dependent we are on our ABI professional staff, um, which is led by Nina as operations manager, um, and covers all the areas of um, research management, um, IT, content marketing, software team, etc. workshop. Um, and so it's a very, quite a big group now, and it reflects the diversity of the operation of the ABI. And um, the fact that we have a very large software group, for example, is a fairly unusual aspect of, um, you, you wouldn't find that in, in other faculties, um, but it's a feature of what we do as an as ABI. Um, so um, I'd just like to, as I always do, just express my gratitude on behalf of everyone for that. Work that the traditional staff do in the um, and later on, uh, Andrew will be, be set up the first time in the war in this area, which Andrew will be talking to. And then, just to emphasize new staff from um, last year, we're, this forum is a little bit later than normal, we would normally have in February, um, so it's actually new staff that have come in over last year since our last forum. Welcome to all the people, not all, if I don't see it, but welcome to everyone who's new to the ABI in last year. So I thought I would just, again, I, I've given this slide before, but I think it's a good way of thinking about the um, how the ABI operates in terms of its income, its inputs, and its outputs, and what it does, essentially. Um, and so you can think of us as being sitting between discovery science on one, on one side and application on the other. We really care about being able to do that translation um, in the areas of all the areas that we work in. Um, and the process for funding that comes from basic science grants and philanthropic donations that feed into the search themes that we've uh, just previously shown. And you can think of a number of those themes that um, represent the activities of the FBI. Computational physiology um, is a big one, obviously. Medical devices, all the instrumentation of the medical devices. And now, of course, with um, Surak and Mark, Link has got two major groups in AR and VR um, in augmented human technologies. Then, the overheads from those basic science grants, New Zealand operates a system where all government grants pay overheads um, associated with the grants based on the people costs of those grants. And that provides up, and the university, we get all that money from those overheads and we pay back to the university with a formula that um, you know, we end up making quite a substantial contribution back to the university. But the, we do have the discretion of how we operate as a, as a faculty or, sorry, as an LSRI within the university with those overheads. And this is a you know, this is a feature of the two LSRIs. It's not a feature of the faculties. They have less, in a sense, they have less discretion than we do in the way that the whole library process is managed. Um, so it's a very transparent, very fair system, I think. Um, and those overheads then go to support the administrative structure and a lot of the, um, the things that are common across all the research groups from the left. Um, and then we get funding from tech, the Tertiary Education Commission, for our role in graduate training. Um, and we are within a university, graduate and postgraduate training is absolutely essential. PhDs and master's students are the engine room of our research activities. Um, and so we get funding from the government through tech for the training of those students. And that's a major and important part of our overall income, along with the the overhead money from the grants in terms of, of running the institute. Because most of the costs of the grant, of course, are direct costs for actually doing the work specified in the grant. Um, and then we also get 
um, business investment uh, into our by our spin out companies or by um, help with any services, getting money that's targeted at the application development side of things. Um, and the philanthropic donations is, is something relatively new to the ADI, and I think um, it's become a very big part of our operation now, and it's hugely beneficial in terms of its discretionary aspect. It doesn't bring in overheads, but it gives us the ability to, and, and thanks to Nicole's work in identifying appropriate donors, it really gives us the ability to um, provide additional funding into specific areas that we can persuade donors to contribute to. And then you can, down the bottom there, you can think of the, the basic science part of it, giving journal papers and patents um, as our major outputs. You can think of the graduate training as providing jobs um, for students and outcomes in terms of clinical trials and then outcomes from the business investment in terms of spin-out companies. And we, we really pride ourselves on being a place where we encourage the development of entrepreneurial activities and spin-out companies based coming out of the research because in many ways it's New Zealand's biggest challenge I think in terms of research that there's so little on the whole connection between high quality basic research and real outcomes that benefit the country economically um, as well as in other areas environmentally etc and health care yeah, but for us one of the major ways that we can contribute back to the country is through these spin out companies and every every medical process that we want to get into practice is going to be through a company. Um, you know, things that operate effectively in the lab or as part of the collaboration with a local hospital is always going to be local. The only way you're going to get things into a widespread usage out of our basic research is through this one. And, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. So this is the new grants in 2021. 20, 20, um, the first time you have the opportunity to put all the actors of people on the slide. But it's a very, very impressive array of new um, grants, including some significant awards. Um, but too many, unfortunately, go through this time. Um, and then this is a picture of our income for the last 10 years, or 12 years, sorry. Um, and we've, you know, we seem to have survived the pandemic very well. It's had a lot to be the middle of the pandemic. We're surviving, of course, the the demise of the MedTech core in June of this year, um, hopefully with some alternative funding to replace aspects of it. But um, the API is big enough now, I think, to be able to survive the inevitable um, rise and fall of particular grants. And that's a really important part of the sustainable long-term research institute is that you're not just dependent on the ground. So it's, it's tempting to put curves through this. This is my 15% growth rate curve for the last uh, few years, which we seem to be following. Um, but you've always got to be very cognizant of possibility. We're not expecting it, but we cannot afford to take our eye off the maintaining the long term sources of income. Um, and then, in terms of people growth, that's just continuing at, at a slower rate for the income. But that's the uh, fracture of students, professional staff, again, it's done. And we're now up to around 300 in terms of full time um, members of the ABI, but closer to 500, and we're clearly all the people that have part time. Um, post grad students, 64% uh, international now, obviously that's dropped a little bit this year. For, and then we can pick up again as soon as we can. We'll get back to our international travel engagements to try and recruit students from other countries. Um, it's dominated by four major, up in Zealand, four major areas around India, China, and Japan, through Syria. Through Syria, sorry, Australia. Um, there's two new countries, which we're very proud to see there this year, uh, and Ethiopia. Fantastic because I think the effort has always been made to hold where our, um, where our students come from. Um, and then where do our graduate owners go? Uh, the, the 250 ABI at the online worldwide, um, and 40% of those are currently overseas um, in 
those countries actually get. It's not the full list, but those countries have kept it up. Um, I haven't updated the employment figures, so this is just the same as last year, but roughly 60% are going to be um, in our companies, um, 20% into New Zealand toxic related, or not necessarily just toxic, or rocket fuel as well. Um, I will, I'm trying to do a break, a, a more fine brain breakdown of this at the moment. Um, so I'll update that next week. Um, and then just for interest, 102, 34% of aviation and professional staff are aviation. So here's our spin out companies, and um, this continues to grow. You know, Thanks to the efforts of new services, and thanks to Dai, to Tecla, and new cloud mine um, activities. Um, and what's really encouraging is to see the metric sector now, by the way, it's a 1.9 billion fastest growing sector of New Zealand um, economy. Um, certainly, um, well, I, I think it is actually the fastest growing. It's obviously we're still, as a country, dominated by agricultural. Um, our plots, but the technology sectors are uh, contributing now around 10 million in the total. And the tech is close to 2 million, of course, dominated by But what's great news, I think, it is um, these three companies, ABI Spin Outs, um, are all finalists in the New Zealand High Tech Awards, a um, little bit in a competitive sense. The nice of the entry got the one that's the other two are not going for. But we'll find out in a couple of weeks um, who's won these awards. But really, congratulations to these companies, um, which maintain you know, strong links with the research activities of the ADI. And it's just fantastic to see the development of these spin out companies who then become providers of our programs. So I just want to finish by talking for a few minutes about. <laughs> Lots of things, and um, I think as many people know, we're thinking about where we go next. We're still in the least building. Um, we make it work, we love, but it's not a long-term solution. And the consensus is that we would like to be closer to FMHS and like to be closer to the hospital, the children's hospital. So we really want to move up to Grafton. Um, we were scheduled to move into the Gateway building, but which was going to be on the C campus, um, but that's now completely off the cards at the moment of flight travel, because of the financial implications of travel. And maybe from our point of view, that's perhaps an important thing, because it's allowed us the time to actually reflect more on where we really should be, which I think is uh, up in the right way. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the possibilities of that. Um, we have a we commissioned a report in the Tech Innovation Quarter in Grafton, and we're now busy talking to the government, to the um, local city council, and Auckland and Wellington, which is a bigger picture of the development development of Auckland. Um, we're talking to the ADHBs, the other partners in our CBT network, um, in our consortium of medical device technology. So, trying to make this a New Zealand mission, not just an Auckland mission, and to make sure that we're also addressing some of the needs of, say, ABT as well in Auckland. But it is going to be primarily a, a university um, initiative, particularly from the ABI perspective of a new location. Um, and we're really thinking that you know, Cloud9 has been a huge success, I think, but we need more space, much more space. And we want these companies to be close to not only to the research activities of ABI, to the business expertise for human services, but also to the um, procurement and engagement with clinicians through the hospital. And a lot of our collaboration, increasingly our collaboration with the NHS, make it very logical that it should be closer to the NHS. And they're very keen on that to happen. Um, so the, the one, we did have our site set on this location here, which is just across the bridge from across Grafton Bridge um, on the corner of Grafton Road. Um, and it's, um, it's pretty unlikely, and I think it's not so 
pay you up the front, but it's, it's a property that is not for sale, it's for lease, it's for long term lease, but in this in if you're not so sure how long term lease. So we are looking at other um, possibilities as well. We have quite run up on that tonight, but we are looking at others. One well, option two is the old liberties, just to get my pages to the other system we have now. Sorry, the ABI is now this is a we are physically right now. Um, so another possible is the old Ligon site, which used to be the night bank, it would need to go and need to be bold. It's actually a lot of room, but it's quite a good footprint. The problem there is just the um, zoning. Well, not so much the zoning, but the fact that the, there's a lot of um, houses um, nearby in the restrictions on how close you can go to the boundary and the height you can go and so on. So there's more limitations on that site. Um, another possible option would be a top end new market campus, which the university already owns opposite the, uh, the railway station. That would have some advantages in terms of being close to areas where the, um, a lot of the kids who spin out companies could design in the market. That's only in the new market campus. It's further away, it's a sort of three minute wall that says that the medics, if you want to really engage the company, you can about three minutes on the road. Um, it's, I don't think we should take that one completely off the options at the moment. Um, option three is a very desirable site that's currently on the market. Um, and then I think there's also, we, we should also be still considering buildings down, um, down the south, south Grafton Road on the other side of the hospital, um, which are all commercial buildings at the moment, so it's still not. Um, but one way or another, I think we will end up in Grafton. I think it is going to take five years before we get there. And at least, um, we, are, we do have a lease on our current building in uh, six years, so we're not going to be out on the street. Um, but I'm part of a, I've set up a steering group that's um, headed by EFL next to Public Citizens, and it's got all the key people that can make decisions on this in the university. Um, and we'll come up with a plan uh, in the next uh, few weeks and then we'll expand it to engaging with the wider community of people that we want to, the stakeholders and so on, and the hospital and government innovation and so on. But there's, there's very, very strong um, feedback coming from all these groups in terms of wanting the NBA to be at the heart of the medical technology and innovation quarter close to the medical office of hospital. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. And the noise was not your fault, it was the laptop uh, on the left. <laughs> um, so it's now time to start with our first presentation on the uh, API perspective. So we'll have a series of four presentations, spanning each, each spanning about five years of the institute, and we have we have looked at the people 
to be better during the time. So to start, who cares about the infancy or like the early years of ABI, we have uh, Cole and Mark in the key representation. Okay, so um, we have a really short time, but I was going to give a little bit of a glimpse of how the, uh, the ABI started. Um, in fact, it started uh, uh, way back in the late 70s when Peter and Bruce uh, returned to New Zealand from the uh, um, UK, Peter from Oxford and uh, um, Oh, okay, all right. So, I forgot what university came from, so here we go, right. Um, and we, 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 uh, we wanted to set up a, uh, a bioengineering group because there was Andrew McCulloch, Ian Anderson, and I who were very interested in applying the engineering science uh, techniques or that we had, had learned in our undergraduate years uh, to biological problems. And Peter and Bruce were there at the time to uh, gather us together and focus our interests onto uh, heart mechanics. Um, we would meet every uh, um, week or so um, to start a, a, basically a, a journal club. Um, but one person would bring along uh, the dinner for the night because these were early evening. And you know we would uh, we would talk uh, about our plans, but also going over the the important papers in the, in the cardiac field. And for us engineers, uh, you know Ian, uh, Andrew, and I, that was really really important because uh, you know we had the uh, mathematical and engineering background, but uh, but not physiological. So that was a, a fantastic way to, to get us up to speed. Um, one of the things that I remember about uh, Peter was um, his foolhardiness, uh, at least what seemed to, to me at the time to be, you know, we were strapped for uh, computing resources in, uh, in the university. Um, there was a very large shared uh, um, IBM, uh, initially Burroughs, but then IBM machine, uh, that was, was heavily used um, towards the mid uh, 1980s, um, or in the latter part of the, yeah, it was a bit 1980, I think, um, Peter decided this was uh, insufficient, so we as a group needed to buy a, uh, a mini computer, a, a Microvax 2, and that's what that thing is on the side there. That was a bloody expensive machine, uh, at least to a, a, a you know, new PhD student that seemed that way. But it really gave us uh, independence, but it also was an indication of uh, Peter's commitment to providing resources you know, to get the jobs done. Um, that was expanded, uh, I think, in, uh, when was that? That was in the 1980s. Uh, uh, no, when did the power challenge come through? Did it have that 95. <laughs> So 95. Okay, so that was exemplified again with the purchase of the uh, this very very uh, powerful um, at that time computer uh, that was unfortunately too big to cable through the door. So the roof had to be lifted off to uh, one of the parts of the engineering building and, and crane into place. Um, now why isn't this moving? There we go. Um, so towards the late uh, 1990s, a good deal of our funding came through commercial contracts uh, with Physio Sciences and Pacific Hydro and Mirage. And we were very lucky with, uh, with, with Peter and Bruce's uh, sort of vision of what needed to be done, but also the support of John Kernan at Uni Services and uh, John Hood, the Vice Chancellor at the time. Um, recognized that there was great potential in bringing together the uh, uh, bioengineering group, uh, that collaboration between engineering and, uh, and physiology, uh, to create the institute that uh, uh, Peter mentioned earlier. So in late uh, 2000, uh, early 2001, the an institute was established. Um, with around about 30 people uh, involved. Um, what I've got here is a, a list of 20 or so of the, uh, the, the people who were part of the group that uh, you know, when ABI 
was established and moved up to the uh, um, uh, Sydney Simon Street, um, who were still around. There were a few more, of course, who had uh, moved on. But you may recognize some of the very, very you know, young faces there. <laughs> you'll, you'll notice also that these uh, photos are quite grainy because they're really that quite old. <laughs> So we all fit into level six of 70 Simon Street when we first moved there. And you know, we were able to do so for around about a year. We had the lab facilities in what is currently the, uh, uh, you know, the kitchen area on level six. Uh, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew asked me to put this up there because uh, you know, we did have some quite dangerous chemicals there. <laughs> there may still be residue. <laughs> so, um, one, of, one of the sort of things that drives, I think, us, or many of us in the Institute are drugs, of course. Um, <laughs> there are many of them, but one of the most important is caffeine. When we first, uh, um, well actually before we moved up to 70 Simon Street, uh, we had an espresso machine that uh, Philip's duo, uh, they are real, uh, real mean beast that was. Very, very temperamental. Um, <laughs> if, if you, if you uh, took the, uh, the coffee thing off too early while the pressure was still built up inside, <laughs> there would be an almighty explosion. <laughs> so there was always, you know, this, this uh, dicey move, you know, should I take it off now? <laughs> the next cup of or not, because if it blew up, you know, well, it would be best to uh, clean up. Uh, by contrast, the latest machine that we've got over there, um, I can't remember the name, RTB2 or something, <laughs> it's got flashing LEDs, and it does all the thinking for you, and it is not dangerous, which is a bit of a mixed blessing, because there is, there is nothing like the kick of caffeine with the, um, uh, the um, you know, a drive of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, adrenaline. 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 <laughs> I've been so worried about this talk this morning that I haven't had my coffee. <laughs> okay, in the first year, we uh, um, uh, organized, or were instrumental in organizing two conferences. One down in Queenstown was the uh, New Zealand Society of Biomechanics meeting, um, and then, which was very successful. Uh, we had uh, uh, many people come to that. Um, and then following, immediately following that in Christchurch was the uh, IUPS conference. So a very large conference uh, that was um, very innovative in the sense that uh, um, you know, Peter and the organizing committee uh, tried to make this a paperless uh, uh, conference. So all of the proceedings, every year, all of the organization uh, you know, was uh, provided online. And it turned out you know, to be extremely successful. That coupled with a focus on posters rather than uh, formal presentations, I think, made it quite innovative. We quickly ran out of space in um, level six, um, especially for laboratory space. Um, so the following year, within the year, we took over level five um, and also bought a substantial piece of machine, a lovely um, Evo Marco uh, 35 uh, five-axis mini machine. And you know, again, this was this was enabled by Peter's vision, really, to um, uh, you know provide resources. To uh, enable us to get our science done, you know, without impediment. Um, unfortunately, <coughs> that couldn't fit in the elevator either, so that had to be uh, uh, craned up, which was uh, quite an impressive maneuver. There's always been a strong sense of community, certainly in the early days, um, uh, and that's sort of exemplified by the uh, um, uh, the end of the appointments <coughs> that uh, that we had. The first one in 2001 was, uh, uh, this was a party to uh, Turku and Martin, um, but these have uh, been followed by uh, um, uh, similar sorts of parties to Motorini and uh, Blockhouse Bay and more recently uh, uh, Narragat Beach. 
And associated with that, uh, with those parties, has been a celebration uh, with the families of the members of, uh, of ABR. Um, there was always uh, a Santa there, um, as you can as you can see, and lots of uh, activities. Um, usually, Santa had a reindeer, at least in the early days, which took the form of a squeegee mop. Um, and um, often the reindeer would have an accident, uh, the, uh, the water soaked uh, mop would be squeezed and there would be a um, <laughs> just left behind. Um, one year we had children uh, responding enthusiastically uh, when uh, Santa asked if any of them you know, would like some chocolate raisins. Um, and uh, when they realized, however, that chocolate raisins were accessed by lifting up the tail of the, of the reindeer <laughs> and uh, you know, grabbing the, the, the raisins uh, uh, via that route, um, there was only one person who uh, decided to go through with that, uh, Sam, uh, Marty's uh, boy. Uh, he, he ended up with a, a whole rectum of... Uh, <laughs> There was also sort of fun prizes given. Um, so, for instance, uh, Edmund Crampen was uh, given a can of spaghetti for his work on systems biology um, and, you know, the complicated pathways that uh, are represented with that. Nick Smith was given a cell phone charger for his work on cellular energetics. And uh, Peter was given a t-shirt with this emblazoned on it uh, in recognition of his countless uh, playing tricks. And, um, I've actually never seen him wear it. <laughs> I think he's living in Norway. Huh? We also uh, had some uh, uh, sort of skits that were put on. This is one of the, the last ones that I was involved in. Um, and it was really about using uh, the Rocky Horror Picture Show as a uh, sort of a, a basis for a commentary on the ABI. Um, you can read some of the, uh, um, the lyrics there, but I mean, basically it was uh, uh, displaying Doctor, you know, the, the, the Rocky Horror Picture Show that showed uh, Frank and Berger's, uh, obsession to create uh, a person, a uh, Rocky. Um, and I think that was, uh, we're trying to mirror that with uh, Dr. Frank and Hunter's commitment to build the virtual physiological human. Um, and, and also, there was a sort of a commentary on the dangers of excessive power, um, you know, when one person has the, uh, uh, the ability to control uh, a large you know, group of institute. Uh, but fortunately, I'm glad to say that we found an exception to that rule. Uh, um, just noting also that uh, uh, the, the reason we chose the Rocky Horror Show was uh, that it was created by a New Zealander, Richard O'Brien, and there is actually a, a statue of him as Riff Raff, a uh, character in the play uh, in Hamilton, uh, of all places. Um, yep, so Often I would rope, rope my, uh, my daughters uh, into the uh, into this lake. So this is just some photos from that Rocky Horror show. Um, it, it, was, it was a lot of fun, um, but rather uh, let down by uh, my family's inability to sing. <laughs> um, there was also a... Uh, a an attempt to provide a sort of a branding for the uh, for the ABI in 2005, 2006, and a uh, um, a company was commissioned to uh, come up with a uh, a branding, a logo, um, and this is uh, what was uh, put forward. Um, initially, it wasn't really clear what that meant. You know, how could it represent the uh, um, the institute? Um, so there's a lot of discussion about that, but in fact it turned out that uh, there, 
it, it was quite a nice, uh, it was quite a, it was abstract enough to be interpreted in many, many different ways. <laughs> so, <coughs> we didn't accept that, uh, that logo, and, and now we've got a, uh, um, a university mandated uh, um, logo. <laughs> Anyone recognises. Um, so uh, that's all I have time for. If you have gone over time, I'm really sorry. Um, but, yeah. so, thank So my head is an hourglass. It's still memory is fine, but uh, now it only retrieves it one at a time and out of order. So with that disclaimer, let's wind the clock back a couple of decades for some personal reflections. In the spring of 2000, with our first child on the way, and my geothermal consulting literally running out of steam, I was job hunting. There was an unmemorable interview on a gloomy room on a hosing wet Auckland day and a memorable one, on a sunny day in an office with expansive views to a far-flung horizon. So the choice between job offers was no contest. In early January 2001, I joined Peter, Bruce, and the Sunny Bioengineering Group at 70 Simon Street. They were on a quest for the holy grail of computational physiology, the physio, or a mathematical and computational description of the body. And they offered a compelling, multi-scale, globally financed, globally partnered, and globally resourced vision and pathway to get there. Entering this environment with its utopic vision, roundtable collegiality, and the corporate spires of 70 Simon Street was like being invited into the mystical Camelot of King Arthur's court, where knights sat around planning and executing their next quest for that holy grail. Many of the ABI were engineering science spin-outs, and having cut my research teeth in that department, I knew them well. I'd even met Bruce a decade earlier, when we unsuccessfully applied for summer funding to design a new physiological measurement tool called a microcalorimeter. Peter's generosity was legendary. I wasn't even one of his students, but he invited me to join them in his lounge and dining room during the five-week great inner city power outage of 1998, when 60,000 people were forced to work from home in a mostly pre-home internet era. A Peter organized a local network of computers in his house in Parnell. It wasn't surprising then to discover at the ABI a generous environment with coffee, tea, weekly lunch meetings with lunch provided, weekly breakfast meetings with breakfast provided, cruises to islands in the Hauraki Gulf for Christmas parties, and so on. What distinguished the group and really glued us fraternally together was the CMIS software stable. This included the CMIS computational back end where physio models were loaded and sold, and CMGUI producing stunning images that wowed the world. CMIS code is like a museum. Browsing it as a trip down memory lane, as many comments are dated and initial. Peter began writing Seamus around 1979, and Paul Nielsen and Ian Anderson contributed soon after. If the ABI at 70 Simon Street was Camelot, then Seamus was Excalibur. <laughs> to participate fully in modeling at the ABI, we had to master Seamus and understand its structures and variables. Even now, looking at the intellectual property embedded 
in those hundreds of thousands of lines of code is quite amazing. By 2002, 2003, the code base of CMOS included a mixture of extended Fortran 77 with C for memory management, Perl as an inbuilt scripting language, and IBM AIX compiler backdoors that were used to bring maximum performance from the RISC chips that were at the heart of our supercomputer. The computational heart was arguably the flagship of the Physiome project. Peter and David Bullivant, who I reported to at the API, decided that our first project together should be the electrical modeling challenges at the pointy end, or apex, of the heart. The heart models were built from 60 high-order finite elements, an approach unique to the Auckland bioengineering scene. Other groups used many small elements to describe their hearts. In the end, we ultimately all got mostly to the same electrical modeling outcome, but the ABI approach was much more elegant and certainly looked that way. To orient elements correctly, they had to be collapsed at the apex, becoming degenerate. Electrical modeling solutions relied on distributing a high density of points throughout each heart element, but this worked badly in degenerate ones. We devised the notion of a closure element to plug the apex, a nifty idea with natural control of point distributions. Sadly, I have now lost the code in original documentation for closure elements. All that remains is a printed 20-year-old report in black and white and these fading memories. Regardless, we couldn't sell closure elements to the Siemens development team anyway. So we pivoted to devising new methods for generating well-distributed points in normal degenerate elements. And this was quite successful, but the project wound up before full Siemens implementation. Now, while we were playing around with grids and closure elements, Peter, Bruce, Andrew Pullen, and others we're completing a project on tissue-specific modeling that was to be highly influential in translational cardiac electrophysiology. And as the door shut on the closure element project, Bruce and Andrew adopted me to do some actual modeling, confirming and expanding on their original findings. We had a successful time developing robust new methods, expanding them in CMOS and making use of the new IBM Regatta supercomputer that came online in 2002 with 32 processors and 32 gigabytes of shared memory. Now before you smirk behind your gaming laptop, with these specs, our Regatta was rated to 166 gigaflops and was ranked one of the top 100 supercomputers in the world in 2002 for a few weeks. <laughs> Working with Bruce, it wasn't long until we pivoted even further so that modeling became a subservient interpreter of experimental recordings and imaging studies. And for a numbers guy, it's exhilarating to hold a beating heart in your hands. You don't feel that through a keyboard. Chris' attention on the ABI began to grow. Perhaps one of the most memorable was the Unlimited magazine in early 2002. And Vincent Hittinger's writing is timely given recent events on the Auckland Harbour. Building models is an arduous task, but the result is a series of movies that make the virtual spectator's American Cup graphics look like ancient art. Because the measurements and maths are so detailed, the model is not just an artist's impression, it's as close to making a heart as you can get without being the Almighty. The article also nicely summed up the two ABI founders. Most importantly is the engineers' confidence in the logic of their progress. Ten years ago, people were saying that what we wanted to achieve with the heart was too complicated, <coughs> says Spain. But if you do proper science with a systematic approach and employ today's computing power, we've shown that it is possible. Peter Hunter is more straightforward. It will happen. It's just a question of when. The header was a memorable photo of five leading scientists, engineers, and mathematicians looking for all the world like knights of the round table embarking on their quest for the holy physiome grail. Sadly, the drama and atmosphere was a little undone by the second title. 
<laughs> but like any metaphor, a romantic notion of Camelot at 70 Simon Street in the early 2000s has plenty of loose ends. But pivoting, adapting, and remembering unfinished business is a consistent thread in the ABI story. And there can be no doubt that much of the adventure and dreams of those early days remains embedded in the DNA of the ABI, and we are now coming full circle back to the future. Thank you very much, and uh, Mark and Paul for the presentation. We have a small token of appreciation. <laughs> yeah, once again, thank you for this trip down memory lane. It was so interesting to see so many young faces who are still in the API. But we can still recognize you all of the age while. <laughs> Okay, so we continue now with our um, first session of uh, three minutes in this presentation. <coughs> and uh, after that, you know, we uh, give a few more about service committees. So we have um, ten presentations this morning, so for those who are presenting, if you can maybe move uh, toward the front and be ready to uh, Presenting the order of your given. So, presenters now will also present the poster at the closing session that we uh, follow. And of course, we'll have time for questions. Uh, uh, we we'll continue the discussion in front of the, of the posters. If you're presenting, uh, I will raise my hand after 2 minutes and 30 seconds when you see my question. And uh, I will stop you after 3 minutes. Now, the winner of our community presentation competition will be API Now let's take our 
connected our framework. And the next step of model competition, we need to identify the junction point, which means finding common components and variables among those models which are supposed to be coupled together. How is it possible when modeler select arbitrary names for the variables in the models? How a third person can understand the meaning of each variable? One solution is adding a standard and meaningful labels to the variables for, of the models in a way that makes sense to everyone. Considering all these requirements to have a perfect model composition, we propose a platform which first converts any model into one particular framework and then automatically identifies the junction points. Our goal is to create more complicated models from the existing ones without starting the modeling procedure from scratch. Our study is one of the initial steps toward creating a model of a virtual human body, and turn this kind of combination Yes. 
from the mother. But what happens if the structures inside the placenta, which means the blood vessels, if they do not develop properly as they should, it would lead to functional impairment of this organ, which could lead to long-term disorders for the baby, and also in worst case could be even lead to stillbirth. As you can see the picture of the babies up there, the one on the left is a normal looking healthy baby, and the one on the right is a baby affected by fetal growth restriction, shortly called as FGR, a condition in which the baby is not able to attain its genetically determined growth potential. This condition is affecting nearly 10 to 15 percent of the babies who are by as of now, and there are still no effective treatment as we are still trying to understand how this problem happens in the first place. In my research, I am trying to inject a special type of casting that's called frustrating into the blood vessels of the placenta on humans after the delivery and trying to look at the tiny structures of the blood vessels that you see up in the picture which gives a contrast. I am imaging them using a micro CT which is a small but a high resolution version of the CT machines that we see. So with these images that I get from micro CT, I am putting them into a computational modeling framework to see how these structures will affect the function of the placenta itself. And also, uh, I am, I'm also there are therapies that are being developed for FGR in parallel, but they are first tried in the animal models before putting them into humans. It is not necessarily that the drug which is performing very well in animals would have the same efficiency in humans, because as you can see, the placenta structures in the animals, they are like very straightforward compared to the human which is far more complex. And also, uh, with this data, I'm trying to look at the, uh, how the animals, uh, therapies that are tested in the animals could be easily uh, adapted in the human settings. I will be uh, making a comparative modeling framework, getting the data from the mouse trials and putting them into virtual human clinical trials to understand how this is impacting the function in the humans. Uh, so with this step, we are hoping that this could come up with more improved diagnosis and treatment for FGR and hopefully this will give a good start for the babies. Tissue and vascular remodeling. 
I then used statistical shape analysis to study the lung shape change. After examining remodeling and the shape variation results, I induced patient specific disease properties into the computational model of the lung, which will be used to study the relationship of fibrosis with lung structure and function. My research findings will help the respiratory physicians to avoid the misdiagnosis and accurately estimate IPS. This will help them to prescribe patient-specific drug delivery approaches and pulmonary rehabilitation. This will be a significant contribution towards their treatment plan and help them to foresee the disease and help, help the IPS patients to foresee their condition. So, uh, by now on an average, we have been 45 times but an IPF patient would have been 75 times and aware of each breath he took. Thank you. And the spending on these diseases was a 
around one hundred billion dollars per year. All of them tell us to pick up the root cause of these diseases. And more way than us develop new therapies to save life. So how do we do that? We started by trying to observe what is happening in the sun. We place high resolution sun and electrode array on the surface of the annual gas to crop current flow. We found that electrical activities cause slow waves are happening in the sun. And these slow waves are in part responsible for the mobility of the sun. Thus, we record slow waves from several animals and analyze those recordings to try to solve the puzzle of the identity of the user. By analyzing those recordings, we notice that these rhythmic slow wave propagation patterns is associated with uh, digestive diseases. We also found that the morphology of the slow wave events include the downstroke, also known as activation, and the upstroke, also known as refractory. In the cardiac tube, the time delay between activation and the refractory is a popular topic related to heart infection. However, in the stomach, we most of the study today focus on activation. Thus, my thesis is about high resolution refractory analysis of slow wave events and nutritional activation. By investigating into the refractory, we will know more about the organization of stomach disease. We will know if there is like, any information of the interest within the timing or morphology of the refractory. We may discover the reasoning behind the density diseases as well. We hypothesis that this <coughs> propagation pattern is associated with the refractory. We can use drugs or pacing devices to affect the refractory to test this hypothesis. Ideally, we can find a way to bring a normal slow wave propagation pattern back to normal by affecting the refractory. So based on these findings, new therapies such as variable devices or drugs can be modulated and developed. So if you want to know more, please come to the post and Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
had killed at least nine Māori. And in turn, even though Cook was said to have had a relational view of humanity, he too was slain in retribution um, when he reached Hawaii. So what do we do about our uneven past, our rocky foundation? How do we remedy this problematic situation? Unfortunately, we can't try time travel back. Our technology is pretty good, but it's not yet that good. So my work uses technology uh, and technology that does mess with time and space to bring stories from the past into the future. So pre-recorded our stories using virtual reality, 360 stereoscopic video, and augmented reality using sensors, and then brought to the table in a head-mounted display as a visual overlay, uh, so that visitors to the table and art exhibition can put on the head-mounted display and experience a safe encounter with women who are not really there. They're at home having a cup of tea or lying down having their story um, having been pre-recorded. So what I've discovered is that when people visit the exhibition, they understand social encounter and they can discuss social encounter because they realise its importance. And they also love the time travelling and the space travelling dimension of technology. <laughs> Thank you. 
very much for listening. If you like to know more about the work that I have done, I'll be post number 128. Thank you very much to all of the presenters. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, so, as a reminder, Dina is going to give a short overview of uh, service committees. Then we have the post session, and the presenters that we heard just now will be presenting the posters. Oh, and if you're judging posters and you don't have scoring sheets, you can get them from Amazon. Can I everyone? Um, so, as Peter mentioned earlier, we have a number of committees and service roles at ODI, and last year some of our committees presented what they do. So this year the forum committee asked me if I could talk a little bit about the expectations that we see the service roles and the committees are having here at um, ODI, as many of the committees are now in the process of wanting to rotate their memberships. And we have decided as a rule for all our committees that we would be using the annual research forum uh, as the time, the natural time where those conversations will start um, evolving. So, hence my pitch to you all. So what is a committee? The term committee started back in the 1500s, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but when it started being defined um, in text, around 1620s, it was described as the body of persons appointed or elected to whom some special business and function can be entrusted. The word entrusted is key here. To entrust is to define and provide someone care and protection. So, what's in it for ABI to have committees and service roles? ABI takes pride in the fact that we have a consistent and consistently strive for excellence and a strong community here. And after today, I think you're all going to agree that we're actually achieving that as well. So having committees and service roles are valuable to us because one, it provides a special focus within a certain area. Examples could be our conflict of interest committee, our equity and diversity committee, health and safety, a lot of us would not be able to you know, be able to work and function unless we actually have that expertise and be able to share that expertise within the community. And it also ensures from a community point of view that our voices are being heard. Number two, it's also about connections. So achieving excellence will be done with the connections, and that's connections internally within ABI, but most importantly also to be able to connect with the rest of the university. And that in turn, from a community perspective, creates a sense of belonging. So what's in it for you? A part of your personal career progression through the ABR, to who, university citizenship, it's also an opportunity to gain and even share knowledge and your expertise. It's an ability to get involved in the wider community of the university and external engagement with external stakeholders, it increases your ability to build your networks. And I think ABI, and I think all, are all a good example of the fact that if you have your entire networks, you probably need to be celebrating excellence today. So as part of the committee, you are part of the team. It's not just the chair of the committee <coughs> that's doing your work. It's really important that you're all taking an active part either a specific role or a specific task or project. And to demonstrate that engagement is really when you are also going to get satisfaction of being part of it. So what next? Well, and this goes out to everyone, whether you're a senior leader, you're a student, you're somewhere in the middle, you're a professional staff, a good starting point is for you to consider what service you feel ABI can entrust in you. But I really do urge you to today use the opportunity to speak to any of our chairs, committee members, that you can see most of the demonstrators on the online internet, or you can come to talk to any of us in the executive leadership team as well. Be part of our team of excellence and give back to our ABI.
professional committee, uh, maybe just a word like we have four committees having posters, so outside, so it's one way of getting in touch. Uh, otherwise, you know, on the in uh, internet website, you can find the chair of the committee. So we now have uh, a bit more than 45 minutes for a first break and looking at the board for the morning session. So please be back here. Uh, Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I just show uh, what a CT scan looks like. 
postcards to ARDS patients. So I marked some of the enzymatic regions, which is liquid filling that comes in through the tissue. And, uh, and I think you, which you can see is more posterior. And then, which is as marked here, this is kind of the hallmark of what this ARDS is. So when these patients are doing these peak um, maneuvers, they slowly, uh, many of them will recover because of this positive pressure and the slow liquid filling slowly uh, gets out of the lung. So this guy lung starts, the, the, the lung function and the oxygen um, starts to, the function starts to improve and they start to uh, feel better. Where does electrical coherence sit into this topic, broad topic of ventilation monitoring or lung function monitoring? <coughs> Currently, when a patient is presented with some of these distress symptoms, there is no way, there's a very small fraction of them are actually taken into a scan, mainly because of radiation, but also because of mobility and other factors. So often, an actual imaging data is not available in this. It's a very large proportion of these patients. And that's the starting point of the problem. Electrical impedance offers one of the solutions. There are other ventilation monitoring methods but an impedance tomography stands alone. And that is an imaging, it's a, it's an imaging type method where you actually get an insight or a view or a picture of the lung in a, as a, 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 in a temporal sense to ensure that a little bit more in the next few steps. So EIT essentially consists of a bed of electrodes, mostly single, uh, in the simplest possible form, and where current is passed and there is different structure, anatomical structures at the imaging plane. Uh, airways, vessels, tissue, and, and bone. So they all have different electrical properties. So they all affect or they, are, they all alter the current and the equipotential path line, equipotential lines that are present at the imaging plane, and which is actually is, uh, is leads to this um, what's called an inverse problem. So electrical impedance tomography is an inverse problem where current is passed, but using those that minimal information that you have applied at the boundary, you can, you reverse you track back what that structure might look like and what the air flow into and out of that imaging plane will be. So it's a, it, broadly speaking, ventilation market is a is, is, is a you know, multi million dollar market. But EIT takes a good portion of that as well as it's becoming popular. EIT has been there for a while in geophysical um, brain applications. There are many applications. So EIT by itself is not new. There are, it has, it has, and like I said, it, it's, it's an inverse problem. It is notoriously error prone, so there's no, there's no good and good at this. But recently, with the increase in, with the increase in ICU cost, per patient cost, per day cost, and, and, and the need to get the patient off the ventilator as quickly as possible, there has been an increased uh, interest in EIT as a ventilation and a lung function monitoring tool. One, one another um, tool that I would specifically want to point out is the cure software. Some of you might have heard. This is based off Canterbury. So they use real, they, they monitor lung mechanics at the bedside using some of the measurements that are taken, but that's still not, these are again real time uh, method, but there's not an imaging method. But EIT offers an imaging method. So this pro this project, some of the projects that a um, couple of projects that we have uh, been doing in the last eight months gained added um, interest because of code. And, and, and hence the, the added value that EIT brings in for code. So pneumonia, which is a pulmonary clinical manifestation of code, is associated with pulmonary edema, which is a liquid filling I talked about. So there have been different instances where EIT was able to bring in significant or at least you know, continuous monitoring for some of these patients who were put on ventilators. So there's a big debate on whether I went to put a COVID-19 patient on a ventilator and also went to wean them on. So EIT took um, I don't know, contributed quite a bit in the different clinicians started increasingly realizing the, the, the usefulness of this approach, acknowledging that there are errors associated with this overall technique. I keep stressing that because of the nature of the problem. So the need broadly can be, uh, 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 can 
me say there's two points. One, there is no actual emerging uh, available. The static on the static in the sense of CD or MR, that's possible in a clinical uh, in a website. And even if you have a CD for a patient with this US AI based on ammonia, there is actually no continuous monitoring of the data when they are open with the data or being <coughs> really offered the data. So we set out with the objective of coming up with a low cost deployment of imaging system that can leverage. So this is the, the, the Y part, Y D part of this coming up with, is using some of our knowledge of lung and chest wall shape and the compliance of the chest wall and lung that can be put into these models and test whether they add whether they add value to the overall problem, the inverse problem, and if so, how much and and, and then how, how what's the what's the bridge between the actual modeling and uh, some of the inverse uh, the deconstructions we are doing and how can that be put into a clinically viable system. So without getting into too much details, the like I said, in the imaging plane, there are structures that alter the that, 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 that come with various, various conductivity, electrical conductivity, like airways, blood, blood flow, and so on. So the common method is to do what's called a forward problem, is to guess, because we don't know the conductivity changes within that imaging plane, and that's what makes it all interesting, because you don't know, but you know the structure within that imaging plane to some extent. You assume certain priors on what does this imaging thing to look like. You build certain matrices, and then you do what's called an inver inverse problem, where you estimate conductivity. There are two broad category of approaches: absolute, absolute measurements and difference measurements. Difference measurement is the most popular because you can get away with many of the errors that are typically associated with these type of problems. When you build these priors, which are called uh, during the process of generating these appropriate matrices. The errors can, or the, the uncertainties come in, can, can come in from four different aspects. One, the connectivity of the plane and the structures is there. The shape prior and the geometry prior, meaning because the, the person who's being imaged or the person who's using that very, the, the lung shape is not known. So, and all the lung shape or size of where it sits within the lung is actually not known, because you can't take an imaging plane. You can't, you can't actually take a, in, um, a more a high resolution image. And then there's also other aspects of clinical variability because there's proning and four other features. So the, we've been trying to see what we could, you know, some of the knowledge and models we have developed over years, of what can, where can, where do fit into this system in a broader context. So again, there's, there's, there's a, that leads me to a specific type of question. So if there is prior knowledge of lung shape that we could use, are we, are we, to what extent do they add value? How much will they increase the usability and the clinical application, or the clinical um, accuracy, which which, we, uh, which often is the problem in terms of because all often PAT images are classically known as blobby. They, 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 they just give you a blob, and you can get away with that because as you start moving things around, you can say, oh, it's changing, and there's, there's motion, but there's motion. There's a significant drop on in, 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 in the clinical value of some of these images because there's lack of knowledge around who this person is being and the next is. So that's where some of our models actually come. So this is a very very one what I just mentioned. So the anagrams and structures of the lung shape and lung size at the plane are actually most often not known because there is no associated CT scan around with this. Two other issues that actually um, make this approach less viable is the motion artifact because there is a person who is constantly breathing, side to side switching because of uh, there is evidence that toning and side to side switching helps with ventilation sometimes. Contact because they are these are the electrodes that are sitting on the surface, they might sweat and they might actually lose contact with a whole lot of other aspects that are um, um, that, that, that the algorithm won't see just because they're happening in a clinical um, action setting, but the algorithm may or may not see those or those Think that it's okay. real data, which might be error. From the instrumentation side, there are a whole lot of uh, um, issues that um, go into um, and issues and the developmental aspects that go into the things at the system. So, what what is uh, sampling frequency? So, 
there's a drive that was going to multiple electrodes. So there is single electrode versus multiple electrode, and the industry is picking that up quite nicely now. There are also different stimulation patterns that they're trying to use to, to ensure that uh, yeah, there's good coverage in the imaging plane. Um, so electrode contact and taking. So clinically, this is a big question. So uh, again, it goes back to the first question of anatomical knowledge and electrode placement within the chest cavity. A millimeter or two millimeter differences in electrode position with respect to the sternum and the spine can have an effect on the ultimate outcome of what the reconstructed image will look like. So it is very crucial, it's crucial and important that you know that the electrodes are placed in a certain way in that limited time that they have in a, in a, in a rather busy setting of what an ICU would be. But all these factors actually play into the different reconstruction as well. That brings me to um, what, why this project came about and why um, we are enjoying this journey so far. So there are different aspects to this problem. There's a computational modeling, which is a shape model, and the lung information about the lung shape. There's the instrumentation side and a challenge that they're facing. Um, the people who have been working with them are extremely, um, they're, they're just fantastic, and they, they've, uh, they've expanded the envelope quite a bit in terms of what's unknown, because, again, there's, there might be some um, um, information in there, but there are issues when applying lung models to an actual clinic to, to the, to, and bringing in EIT measurements and combining them to form an image. Going back to the big question of the patient is unknown, the patient's lung shape is unknown. So we have come up with some nice techniques to actually bridge that gap and reduce some of the errors around the shape and um, knowledge about the breathing uh, and motion and, and associated linkage and lung chest wall um, changes during breathing. There's also, from the clinical side, we have people helping us in terms of the actual compliance because all we, we might develop a bed, but it, in a clinical setting it might fail in different ways, different reasons, um, and people who are in the medical device industry will know this. So there are safety and comfort issues, and often we have the instrumentation side of the, uh, not so modeling side, but the instrumentation side has to keep that in mind when they build, build these um, devices to uh, eventually lead up in, um, in a actual device that's going to be used by site. So there are different iterations that we have gone through over these months, from the device testing, device design stage testing stage and also software um, software stage that were initially tested on one or two volunteers. That's again this is a, a, a quite a good avenue for uh, teamwork where there's a lot of discussion and meetings a lot of um, uh, from different so the key I, and the point I want to highlight here is these are groups from with different backgrounds and they often don't talk the same language. And that's what makes this uh, interesting and complicated, that you have to step aside and say, I don't understand the firmware, I don't understand why this is a problem, but mathematically we see that this is feasible. And then there's a back and forth that happens that resolves some of these issues. And that's important for a collaborative project of this nature, it requires a lot of interaction, which, and uh, an interesting science that goes behind some of these uh, Systems uh, that makes it interesting and also potential for you know, a project for uh, that can expand the envelope of some of these technologies. So, the, the error I've marked there is kind of where we are right now. There are still iterations going on with healthy volunteer trials and all that. So, there, there are uh, some tweaks we are making um, along this pathway. So on to some simple, simple uh, reference, sorry, I didn't show much of actual data, but I'm just showing some of the, just to give a feel for what these data typically look like. So this is a synthetic data that we tested to see whether this is not, um, so this is using one of the softwares out there that can do the reconstruction for us. We use synthetic data and puts it, put lesions in different places and tested breathing. So then we start off with a lung shape that is as simple as a circle, and then you invert it back and see where the lesion is and how much of energy you pick up. And then these correlate with lung volume because ideally these should correlate with it. So as you're breathing, you're, there's often uh, 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 an error of inclinations that, that uh, so there's a left lung and a right lung and the sizes could be different. There's, there could easily be a different interpretation between a lesion and an actual size of the lung which might end up being at a smaller lung volume. Or a low fissure that might divide the lung to talk to the posterior and anterior halves but might confound with what an actual disease would look like. So you need to be really careful in how you interpret them, and these kind of 
big models or synthetic models, then you get some of these features where you're building towards these frameworks. So this is one case where we took an actual long model and tested a whole lot of sorry, the really simple thing. Um, and then was to match with that. We, we swapped the exploits and we used the visualization. So this is showing changes in conductivity. This is a reconstructed image showing changes in conductivity in the left and right now at one of the imaging points. Just to go a little, little bit deeper into our area of interest um, on why lung shapes are that different between people. So we took, um, we identified, so typically the wells are put between the fourth and the fifth intercostal muscles. We took um, lung shapes from a whole range of, uh, from, a, from a large cohort and, uh, and, and, and found out what the, from these are those images, found out what the actual chest wall and lung shape looks like. In a normal setting, if we, it was not for some of our models, the, the one you see on the right would be the actual clinical scenario, where you really don't know the size of the patient and you, and you, 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 you know the shape. You can use some atlas based approaches, but they're quite erroneous. On the other hand, some of the uh, techniques we are working on to give in the actual quick estimation of size information that we can put back into some of the statistical models is what you see here, where the error comes down, and this error translates all the way up to all the way to your reconstruction as well, because like I said, shape, you know, the key, shape and size are an important aspect in it, and that can introduce large errors into the reconstruction. <laughs> So this particular study, as you see here, was of um, came the way with some of these uh, and formed the backbone of some of these models that I've been talking about. So this is a statistical model where we were able to fine tune the model. This is one of the um, aspects you see. There are different uh, parameters that control these uh, shapes. Um, this is just a toy model. So I don't know the parameters just to keep it simple, but you do see that age. BMI and many of the and some of the respiratory parameters actually do play a role in the ultimate size. And again, going back, how this can inform, give you an idea of if you have some of these, the demographics is easy, age BMI, but often the respiratory complex and elasticity and other parameters are, become, are, are available in a clinical setting. So, how and people have never used any of these to inform their shape models, all they had to use was just a cell circle or a very simplistic model that they carried on with and use that to understand the Yankee image. But we have an opportunity to put some of these information back into the reconstruction pipeline and see how much difference it makes in improving our overall accuracy. So I'm from a computer modeling background, so I don't know much of instrumentation, but I still but this is a very key part of this project. Otherwise, by itself, computation modeling may not have I take this into the clinic. So we have a, a very uh, smart group of uh, engineers working along with us who have done a lot of phantom testing and real uh, volunteer testing, uh, who have done um, an exhaustive and very comprehensive kind of data analysis and if you look at uh, from the acquisition side, firmware side, and they, they did a lot of iterations for some of these devices. Um, and and um, they put this uh, device to put this system together in an open. So they, they took an open ID system and they Diving deeply into the, into the firmware, and then they, um, and some of the team members are sitting out there. So, so that's from the hardware side. So, this is a front view for some of the volunteer testing that we did. Um, this is showing what we must have an image from the data, which looks fairly very good. So this is from a, this is from an atlas. So we took an atlas for this particular. We know who the person was. So we took an atlas. We took that. We, we matched it with a, a thirty-year-old uh, male, and then we say, okay, here is additional information about the chest wall that you could bring in, and then we started giving us really cool images of the impedance and other two D distribution within the um, surface. There are additional things we have been um, doing to enhance the clinical overall. Like I said, it's, it's a, the story is about enhancing the idea, the objective is also to enhance the overall clinical usability of some of these images. Of course, we, often the feedback we have got is uh, that, that we spoke to um, clinicians is you see an image, but where does it sit anatomically? And the anatomical relevance is often missing. 
I mean, it ties in, plays in well into our card, where you can say, here is an actual imaging thing where the value was placed, and then you could give uh, ribs and fissures, and you could start with, okay, you could, start, you could say that the value was placed more um, basally, or there is a, there's a the fissure is actually covering part of it, and so on. So you could give additional anatomical information by uh, bringing in some of these, um, by incorporating some of the models to, into this overall uh, pipeline of PRG. So, a few other um, um, aspects we have been looking at. One, in, uh, from my opinion, one uh, uh, aspect that has been lost and has been not dealt with enough is the placement of women and women. So, and the, and the associated and shape. So, we have used some of our to bring that information and study that separately to see how much of a difference that brings up. So, both from a chest wall shape and from a lung shape. So, these are two different aspects that you might study. So we are saying, okay, can shape priors, uh, personalized shape priors actually create that much of a greater difference of uh, an improvement in image quality and an improvement in the SNRI? And so how much you, you can, you know, how much of this difference can you bring along? Posture, posture is a, is a, is a, is a, is a you know, topic that's really close to uh, us in, in, in terms of different interest and also increasing um, usability of pronation there some such specific patients will uh, benefit from the uh, from from chronic venereal ventilation. So, the, but none of the as far as I'm aware of any model don't take that into account when we do the drug treatment department. So we uh, have uh, taken we are taking efforts to understand some of the um, changes that happen during pronation and the changes in structure internally and the distribution of tissues that happen to see take that into the fact and see whether how much of that brings about in the world. So these are some of the uh, people who, um, who, who, who we collaborate with, who I collaborate with, who are very key people, key essential, in fact, I'm just a good money focus for a couple of them. <laughs> so uh, I have to stick to the models of the, there's a good, there's an um, extremely um, uh, uh, a smart group of people who are, who are engineers, clinicians, uh, people from a wide range of experiences come in from internationals to correct us, to guide us, and to take us <coughs> forward, mainly from, most importantly, from the instrumentation that the clinical center has in play, step in itself, which has a good challenges from the that I just mentioned previously. So, yes. Finally, uh, some acknowledgments from some of the funding agency that came on time, uh, that was, was perfect to test some of the models <coughs> Setting 
the system can run healthy or yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. that's the that's the elimination in healthcare. Yeah, the one one answer to that would be typically the input rates are getting on bilateral, so there is input rates on both sides, both sides. So that's when we are trying to bring in the rib cage into the picture. The rib cage is still visible on the scan. There's still approval, but yeah, you know, the shapes might be a little bit different when you have um, given the general posterior and the rib cage is what drives the overall arm shape. And you can even don't, don't know whether this is where the is in the arm. That information is still limited. Another question I feel like I have is about you know, detecting uh, information about sensors. Uh, it, it seems to me everything is like a static, just wandering around the torso. So do you have? The plane moves as well. So it just moves around. No, the plane is a fixed plane, but uh, the chest cavity will anyway move. The person is supine, and the chest cavity and the rib cage will anyway move in and out of the detecting plane. So so you don't need any sphincter or something like that to take in different areas of the torso? Just one area should be enough? It's, it's the simplest version of the belt. There are multiple belts, but the simplest version will be in that area and account for those changes from the reconstruction side and not from the hardware side. Because the hardware side will still pass current and look voltage and then um, and look to the time before some of those changes are done account for this. All that is accounted as a reconstruction. There is no in that plane for sure. The ribs and air, air is going in and out this way as well, running way as well. So it's, but there's going to be a dense shape effect that will happen in terms of how the signal propagates. That's a fact that determines whether you have a 2D problem or a 3D problem or something in between. So the domain will matter as opposed to you have air going in and out. There's motion. Okay, we we'll continue with our program. Um, oh, we have, we have time for us. Kia ora, Kia ora, Harry. Oh, thank you. Um, you showed nicely the sensitivity of the reconstructions to, I guess, the geometry, but do you also need to take body composition into account? So different muscular layers and fat layers, sizes of those things. How, how sensitive are the reconstructions to that? Physiology and engineering, neither of which I had any training in. 
Um, so I took that position, and this is the group of people that I was joining, uh, which was a, a, this photograph is just a bunch of guys. Um, <laughs> but Mirren was also part of this group. And so you'll see some interesting faces there. Uh, on the bottom left, you'll see uh, Shane Blackett. But next to him is uh, Chris Bradley and then Paul Nielsen. And as you scan your eyes around, uh, you'll see at the back there Andre David Nickerson. Next to him, Leo Chen, young Leo Chen. And, uh, and then on the right, Nick Smith with his eyes closed and Andrew Fuller. So this was the group I joined. Um, and my job was to build an instrument. And it was actually, coincidentally, the same instrument that Mark True mentioned in his talk, to build a calorimeter for studying heart muscle. So uh, this was us in 2001, a few years later. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why there's gasps at this, but uh, uh, again, an interesting bunch of people, same characters. Mirren is in this shot on the front row there, along with Leo and and the, the guy second from the left, which only goes to uh, support the statement on the back of Paul's t-shirt that everyone loves a fat bastard. <laughs> so Paul and Dennis employed me for this job um, at the Institute to, um, to build this calorimeter. Now, uh, we worked for three or four years on this, on this task, but um, we didn't have the technologies that we needed to perform this task in New Zealand. Um, and I, I would like to say, of course, that while I've been asked to talk about the history of bioinstrumentation and the growth of this aspect of ABI, there was much going on right from the start of Peter Hunter's career, who you can see there on the top right, surrounded by instruments at Oxford, um, and Paul's bioaxial rig um, that he developed over, over several years, and many other instruments that preceded this. Also, the wonderful work done by David Budget, um, who was developing a high electrode count mapping system, Unimap, uh, and of course, uh, Ian McBrice and Bruce Smale had done some really serious instrumentation work. I cannot claim any credit for uh, creating instrumentation as part of the ABI's efforts. It's always been part of bioengineering research group at the University of Auckland. But in 2002, I applied for a fellowship. So while I've been asked to talk about the infants, well, sorry, the childhood of the ABI, I actually skipped its infancy. I was here when it started in 2001, but then I went overseas. So I applied for a New Zealand Science and Technology postdoc. Today, that would be the equivalent of a Rutherford, uh, what do they call, always forget, not Discovery, the other one, Foundation, Foundation Scholarship. So this was a three-year scholarship that allowed me to go to MIT in Boston, where um, we, we, I went to work with essentially a spin-out lab from the ABI which was at MIT, headed by Peter's brother, Ian. Um, and so I worked with Ian Hunter there, and you can see us just vaguely on that mechanical engineering um, shop. Here's a, a rather sinister photo um, <laughs> of a group of us from the bioinstrumentation lab at MIT. There were about 30 of us, up to 30 of us at one time. We will recognize uh, Brian Ruddy on the left there. And we all looked slightly unhappy for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> but it was actually a great experience and a lot of fun working at MIT. And while I was there, I was working on instrumentation that I came back to New Zealand to install in our lab every year. And that's the cardiac instrumentation of the ground floor. Uh, here's, here's a bunch uh, of us again um, at uh, Ian Hunter's inaugural lecture that was gate crashed by a bunch of students who are in this room. Um, this was a celebration of Ian Hunter's um, uh, uh, Distinguished Alumni Award. So in 2008, I returned to the University of Auckland as part of its kind of childhood phase, um, and immediately volunteered to join Paul in teaching instrumentation in the Engineering Science Department. The reason I want to talk about this is that that, that marked, I think, a, a quite a, marked, a, a large increase in the number of students who then joined ABI um, as a consequence. And I've highlighted names here in red from this one year of engineering science, and this was actually the biomedical engineering specialization. All of these students became PhD students and master's students in the ABI. And many of those names you all uh, recognize, I hope. Um, the ones in purple are kind of also still around. Another the top line there, the Sakara, actually did a medical degree, and he's, you'll still find him in our lab on the ground floor of engineering of uh, Sydney Simon Street. Um, 
So this was a, a, a great thing for us in that we began to recruit, um, I think, larger numbers of students into our lab. I'm not going to talk at all about what we um, do, except to say that my areas are in developing cardiac instruments, and um, at that period I started to, to cont I continued that work in Auckland. Um, we were doing all sorts of other things, such as pelvic floor measurement devices that our Jenny Kruger's group used, um, wireless um, inertial measurement units, um, a bunch of robotic devices, um, but also um, jet injectors. And so in 2011, I began to, this was my daughter's cartoon, by the way, um, <laughs> decided to initiate some jet injection work at ABI, and that's become another large focus of our area. Uh, by the way, that, despite the cartoon, I've never done the, the last bit there. <laughs> that happened was um, Paul, I'm Paul looking up for this, a miracle occurred at the ABI about the take, uh, it was about, I think probably about 2008, 2009. Um, it had been observed elsewhere that the Virgin Mary would sometimes appear on toast. Um, and at, at that stage, we had a manager of the ABI, uh, preceding the wonderful Nina Person Fox, we had the wonderful Mary Grigor, and one day, a miracle occurred. <laughs> Mary's face magically appeared on a slice of toast. Anyway, that was, I raised this because we, we continued to develop uh, and add to our suite of tools, and this was the laser cutter, which can be used for great toast. <laughs> so finally, I, I just want to say that because we had um, such bright students coming into um, ABI from engineering science and biomedical engineering specializations, the, the lab on the ground floor has grown, and you'll recognize many of these papers, uh, faces because despite these photos being five years old, many of them still haven't left. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think that's one of the wonderful things about the ABI family is that we, we get to live with people for a long period of time <laughs> and watch them grow. So that's all I have. Leo, thanks. <laughs> passed away in 2012 after a, a moderately long battle with cancer. Um, so he, was, he died at age 47, pretty early on in his career, and he didn't manage to see a lot of um, the successes that he had um, initiated. So it attracted back April 27th, that's my best estimate, Andrew, um, Andrew and some of his students, including me and Greg Sands, we were overseas on a cardiac conference, and Andrew the, the day after the cardiac conference, Andrew visited um, these three gentlemen, Bill Richards, John Wixwell, and Alan Bradshaw at Vanderbilt University. So they had um, two NIHRO1 grants, these are massive grants. One of them had been scored in the top 0.3%, and the other one had been scored in the top 3% of the funding cycles. So they were obviously um, pretty good with their research, but they needed some help with their analysis. They were able to record magnetic fields from the gut, but they were having problems analyzing it, and they wanted to have some mathematical analysis support. So Andrew visited and said, yeah, this will be pretty easy. We can just take what we've done in the heart and we'll just change the shape of it, and it'll be pretty easy. <laughs> it wasn't quite that easy. 
Um, we naively formed a um, research group. There was uh, Andrew Martin Buist, who's now in Singapore, myself, and Nick Smith. And uh, we had one graduate student, Rita Yassi, who was our first master's student, and we plotted away. Um, plotted away for a couple of years looking for funding. We were lucky to get some seed funding from Vanderbilt in the early days. We got some VC funding to keep us going and employed. And then in 2003, um, things started to really take off. Andrew got his James Cook. After two or three cycles of applying for our NIH, we got our NIH in Auckland. And we also got a master grant. So things really started to take off. Uh, this was our first paper in 2004. Um, so after a couple of years, and we could show that we could simulate electrical and magnetic fields. But what could we really do with them? A couple of years later, um, our first application of modeling, okay, we could show that we could simulate far field EEG recordings, surface body potentials, and we're able to show that the standard method they use for analyzing these clinically, which is a frequency analysis, isn't really a good measure. It's able to, it's missing a lot of the key features and able, unable to detect if your dysrhythmias are occurring at the natural three cycle thermal activity. And I'll come back to this a bit later. So we plotted away for about four years doing our modeling type work. Um, we were a little bit frustrated with um, the type of experiment we were getting. We knew we could do a lot better. Bruce and Ian and Lindley and Rick Sands were doing their, um, their experiments <coughs> at med school. And we kind of said, oh, why can't we do some of these experiments ourselves? Um, so in the 30th of January, we did our first animal study. On the left hand side, I've dug out our old reports, and this is a report that Peng's written. I thought it was pretty cool, so I included it. It's got a little um, location of where everybody's standing. And um, on the right hand side, you see the signals recorded, and for those who are unfamiliar, these are, this is all noise. Okay? <laughs> and this happened for about three or four studies, actually. It took us a while to actually figure out what we were doing. Um, but we managed to get some good recordings. We were able to rapidly translate to um, human studies at Auckland City Hospital. We never really thought this was a, something we would actually achieve, um, but we managed to get through the ethics, all the approvals, all the sterilization. I remember all the angst that we had when we first did our um, HDEP ethics application. Um, we, we were really, we were sure we'd get it turned down. We thought we had to go there and be in person and try and answer questions, but I think we went to country or something, but we got approved for our ethics for that, and so that was really cool. So these were conducted in normal subjects. Um, and so the next dream was like, how are we going to do this in disease subjects? It's fine to measure from normal activity, people kind of know what's happening in the normal activity to some degree, and if you're normal, you don't really care what's happening with your stomach anyway, you just eat more food. So we had this dream of actually of translating these ideas towards sick people. This is what we managed to do somehow. We didn't actually think this was possible. Um, but we did this in collaboration with Tom Abel in Mississippi. This is patient number one in October 19th. And this guy here, you see from the scribble of the patient notes here, has daily vomiting and nausea. Okay, he's living a miserable life. He is going in for an implantation of a gastric stimulator. And as part of that, we took um, some time out of their surgery and we were able to record their electrical activity. One of the key findings we found with these patients is they have disordered electrical activity at three cycles per minute. This is the same cycle frequency as a normal patient. So you, with a limited number of electrodes, you're not able to detect it. But by measuring directly on the surface of the stomach, we were able to map and get these dysrhythmias. So I guess um, this is my final slide um, about Ten years ago, we had the dream of and dream of kind of being as cool as the cardiac research group. They had three cycles or four cycles of HRC programs, and we were sitting around scrambling around for money. Oh gosh, how cool would we be if we were like that? I think we've managed to kind of do something like that. We have a relatively good team now. We have a really good diverse um, funding base, and we've received a large number of awards. Um, one person in this building, maybe in this country, has received one of each of these awards on the left-hand side. Um, so, well done to Peng. <laughs> um, and finally, a thanks to all the um, staff and students that past and present. 
Um, and a very big thanks for Lynn Lee, who's helped out with all of our studies and helped to anchor all of them. Um, without these animal studies, um, we'd never link it towards any of the human trials. So, um, thank you very much. And now we continue with a second session of three minutes uh, previous presentation. We have um, nine students, so if you can please move forward and sit close to the front. So same principle as before, but what happened, when you have like 30 seconds left, you just like stand up so you know you don't have to finish up the next 30 seconds. And again, for those students, if you are left in the portal, you can see the session that they provide. is very common, especially among people who are doing sport activities. Therefore, there is a need to have a tool that can assess shoulder joint quantitatively and precisely. Uh, shoulder joint re rely upon shoulder, uh, muscles for stability and normal function. Therefore, uh, characterizing the stiffness of muscles uh, Characterizing the influence of these muscles on shoulder stiffness remains a challenge, but it's very important to understand the normal and pathological function of the shoulder. Uh, therefore, we've uh, designed and built a rig that can measure shoulder stiffness at this functional posture uh, in two degrees of freedom, which are internal and external rotation and abduction and abduction. And uh, this is by uh, creating a small perturbation or shaking to the shoulder uh, and measuring the corresponding angle and torque. So from these measurements and using system identification, we can identify the system that represents the shoulder and can estimate uh, mechanical stiffness, viscous and uh, inertia parameters. The experimental protocol involves recruitment of healthy participants with no history of shoulder injury for our experiments. During the experiments, we asked the participants to maintain the muscles of their shoulder contracted at various levels. That will allow us to uh, estimate shoulder stiffness and parameters uh, at these conditions and uh, to investigate how stiffness change with contraction and how they differ across participants. Preliminary results show the uh, elastic uh, parameter K, for example, increasing significantly with contraction. Uh, so in the next step, we will do experiments on uh, participants with shoulder injury or pathology. So the ultimate goal of this project is to uh, investigate how shoulder stiffness and parameters might differ due to shoulder injury. Therefore, there is a potential for this device to be used as a diagnostic tool to assess so shoulder function and to diagnose uh, pathology. Thank you for listening. If you want to know more about my project, come and see me at number 115.
it's at age 51. Um, and for me, maybe I would like to be like this lady. Hold on. Like this lady. <laughs> In the I'm Samantha Chan, and at the Armitage Human Lab, I look at creating technologies to improve and support human memory. And we want to do this through natural and intuitive ways that are more integrated with our minds, our body, our behavior. And um, one of the examples is that through wearables like this, another example is through mobile apps that we have um, in our smartphones today. Um, and how I started this out, uh, one thing that I did was that I created a, a smart app uh, which sort of teaches you a memory technique and it teaches you how to apply that technique in daily uh, activities such as remembering to go to a doctor's appointment to take your medication. One step further from that, I looked at creating um, more natural ways of um, having memory training. So I created a chatbot uh, which kind of converses with you and teaches you and guides you through this memory technique. And one thing that this, one thing that this um, technologies could do is actually to have a better understanding of ourselves. And so in that, uh, how I do that is through detecting what we call physiological signals or biosignals, such as heart rate and skin reductance. And with this, I know, we'll know when you're calm or relaxed. And with this idea, when you're calm and relaxed, you're probably more open and receptive to more memory training. Um, the next step that I'm looking at is actually looking at how we can um, use biosignals such as our eye movements uh, to look at, um, you know, if, sorry, to look at uh, our intentions to recall something. And um, yeah, so hopefully in the future, maybe in the future with memory training and memory support, we might not need these wearables anymore. Hi everyone. As you can see, it is very hard to transmit information without the ability to speak. Without <laughs> the ability to speak. And try to speak. It's not possible. Well, divers have to deal with this all the time. Once they're on the water, they can't talk anymore and instead use hand gestures to communicate. This works well when they can see each other. But one of your dive buddy can't see you because the water is too dark, or he's busy looking at fish. Or even worse, what if he's swimming too fast and you're struggling to keep up? If you take a second to catch your breath, you realize he's no longer in sight. So what do you do? You panic, you stop thinking clearly, and possibly put yourself in danger. My work has been to develop a better way for divers to communicate on their life, namely using a smart dive rope. The glove recognizes hand gestures used in diving communication converts them into a message, and sends the message acoustically. The diver on the receiving end receives the message through happy and visual feedback. But how does the glove know what gesture is being made? Well, it uses the electric latent sensor. <coughs> These sensors are soft capacitors that whenever they are stretched, increase their capacity in something. So picture this. A sensor placed on top of a finger would, would stretch whenever you bend the finger. 
This means we correlate the bending of the finger to the capacitance value of the sensor. Well, the glove uses five sensors, one for each finger. And with machine learning, it is capable of recognizing different hand gestures, converts them into message, and sends them a message. Now, whenever your dive body is swimming too fast, you can tell him to stop and wait for you, even if he's not able to see you. Diving communication is pretty cool, but in Project Adrian, the project that in collaboration with Croatia, we're using the glove for something much better. Namely, talking and controlling it on the water drone. The drone assists you as a dive body. It follows you around, monitors your health, gives you a ride back to the boat, and much more. All you have to do is a simple gesture to tell the drone what you want it to do. If you want to know more about my project, Please come see me at poster number 39. Thank you very much.
in a control server transport rate and is a contributory factor in non-fluid clearance. So the regulation of these channels is important for normal function of the lung. Channel activating proteases or CAPs are indigenous serum proteases or enzymes in many epithelia. The proteolytic effect of these enzymes with both activation of ENAC by cleavage of ENAC subunits, uh, specifically on fine gamma. As you can see in figure 2, after proteolytic cleavage, possibly there is a deformation in ENAC subunits, which may lead to sodium transport. On the other hand, the presence of serum protease inhibitors or serpents inhibit the inner activity by the inhibition of the enzyme activity. It is reported that for normal activity of inac, there should be a balance between the presence or expression of the proteases and protease inhibitors. The goal of our study is to investigate CAPS expression in A549 and H441 cell lines, which are broadly used as alveolar epithelial models, in two cell conditions of ALI, which is adequate interface and lysine. In addition, the inhibitory effect of A-protein and PN1 as two inhibitors on the enzyme activity has been investigated. <coughs> Regarding the results, figure 3 and 4 show CAPS expression in A549 and H441 cell lines in mRNA and protein level, excluding the expression of CAP1 and 4549 in protein level. Gene expression and protein expression were measured at qPCR and the same techniques. The fly for is the enzyme activity in fluorescent rate, which is measured by a microplate looking device. And the data shows that the enzymes are more active in H441 cell so lines, specifically in lysate condition. And the data shows that the inhibitory effect of A protein is more effective than P and D in both types of cell lines. And eventually, we are planning to investigate the cleavage effect of these enzymes on the index of these by using uh, these two types of cell lines. My poster number is 95, and it's my pleasure to take your class and answer your questions today. Thanks. Hey, everyone. My name is Nadun. I'm from the Circulation and Transport Group. And for my project, I've been developing an anatomic <laughs> Uh, so my, for my project, I've been developing an anatomically realistic computational model of duodenum motility. So the small intestine is the primary site of enzymatic digestion and nutrient absorption in tubers. So we know there's a range of different contraction patterns present within the intestines, for example, peristaltic contractions. And these patterns are responsible for ensuring that the enzymes and chemicals secreted into the intestines are well mixed with the partially digested food that it receives. And these contractions also increase nutrient absorption by making sure the nutrients actually reach the intestinal walls where the nutrient absorption takes place. And we also know that there are some gastrointestinal motility disorders which are associated with abnormal motility patterns. For example, irritable bowel syndrome, which is diagnosed by belly pain or spasms that are associated with changes in the appearance or frequency of an individual's bowel movements. And another example is intestinal pseudo-obstruction, where the intestine's ability to push food throughout is, throughout is severely impaired. So in terms of these different motility disorders, we don't quite understand how they impact the flow and mixing that occurs within the intestines. So we turn to computational models. And in terms of existing computational models, they typically use simplified geometries to represent the duodenum, and they use unrealistic or idealized contraction patterns. So in my work, I've developed an anatomically realistic model that uses an actual human duodenum geometry and contraction patterns that are derived from electrophysiological data. We've also conducted 
um, ex flow experiments within a phantom model to validate our numerical results. And some of the outputs from my model include velocity vectors, which show the speed and direction at which digester moves. We've also looked at um, how different nutrients, for example, glucose, undergoes mixing. And in future, we plan to see how these patterns are affected by the abnormal motility patterns. Thanks for listening to my talk, and if you have any other questions, come see me at poster number 97. Basically, the movements of the anchor. 
So the inversion is the movement towards the inner side of the body, and the eversion is the movement towards the left side. So you can see an infant growing here during the first year of a human walking, so 12 months up to 24 months. And the inversion torques are increasing here. The infant is also working more and more similar as the adult. Uh, but what's interesting here is that since the inversion is the middle motion, it's uh, related to the MG activation. So to look at the, the medical imaging and how these two muscles change uh, from one another, we use the medical imaging and PCA to, to evaluate how they were changing. And on the bottom right, you can see that as infants grow, the muscles are growing in volume as well. But what's uh, really important here to see is that the LG appears to grow more elongated and thinner, whereas the AG grows wider. So clearly there is an association between MG width with increased MG activation and MG inversion force. And this is the four partner relationship. And you can find me on Photoshop 69 for more questions. Thank you. My parents gave me a name Ishan Gumilar, which I didn't fully really understand the meaning of it until now, to be honest with you guys. I have a question for all of you here. Does anyone of you want to spend the rest of your life with strangers? None of you? Fair enough. In fact, being or living together with strangers is unavoidable, like us. All of us here were strangers at some point until we came to ABI and we introduced ourselves to one another. In the world of social psychology, people have been trying to find whether the brains are synchronized in certain situations, particularly as people communicate in offline situations, such as doing conversations with, with mother and children, with, with couples, or when people look at each other. And then, as you know, in this COVID-19 period, a lot of people have communicated virtually by using Zoom, Teams, Google Meet, you name it. And then we think, would there be any brain synchronizations as people communicate virtually? You know what we did? We brought a couple of strangers into our lab. They don't know each other until they came into our lab. And then we asked them to wear virtual reality so they saw each other in the form of avatar. And then we asked them to do simple hand gesture interactions. This gesture has been used by previous races. You know what? Interestingly, we found that after the first four minutes of interactions, the brain of the strangers are getting synchronized. Not only that, in our daily communication, we need to be able to feel what the other person feels. We need empathy. So empathy, we put ourselves in another person's shoes. And then we set them up into the same perspective. When you were wearing PR, as if you were inside my body, and then as if I was inside your body. So what we found, as people were put in the same perspective in virtual reality, the brains are getting even more synchronized. So having said that, I conclude that virtual reality is able to induce into brain synchrony among people. So if Nokia, a big telecommunication company, has a famous tagline, connecting people, then I do have a tagline, synchronizing the brains of people. Thank you. Thank you very much for the order of the speakers this morning. Uh, 
um, talk. Yeah, let's thank all of our presenters once again.
Uh, ten years later, I went to my first gastrointestinal meeting, group meeting, this year, and I was impressed by the amount of donuts that those guys had. <laughs> <laughs> so, by 2011, I was um, two years into my postdoc here at ADI, working with Marin, and I pretty much jump shipped from women's health, and I was um, looking at developing new tools that can predict the risk of poor outcome in pulmonary hypertension. So I had kind of picked up from work that Kelly Burrows, who doesn't feature on the slide, had been doing during her PhD. And in 2011, Harry Kimmel also joined our group, so that was kind of a big year for the respiratory group. And so the outcome of that um, postdoc work was um, that I, for the first time in the respiratory area, was able to create quite a lot a, a, a large-ish number of personalised models of the pulmonary vasculature, and I was specifically looking at the impact of when blood clots get lodged in the pulmonary vasculature and how we can predict differences in outcome between those different patients who have um, quite a lot of blood clot you can see in the there on their blood vessels. So 2011 was kind of the year where a lot of that were kind of started to come into fruition, but it was also the year that I started to sneak back into women's health and, and reproductive health research. So through Marion and Peter, I was um, involved in a placental atlas project which was happening internationally, so I got to meet a lot of people who were doing placental research. And while the placenta and the lungs are not entirely the same, they're both organs, so they both oxygen and they both have branching structures that you can see in the, um, the lung models and in the placenta models that will come later. Um, we wrote the project, although maybe we didn't start in 2000 until 2012, and I think we wrote the project for our first placental project, and we recruited our first placental PhD student label. And um, Larry Chamway, who works in obstetrics and gynaecology, um, started to ask this question about lungs, actually. So he um, came along and started asking questions about what would happen if um, little bits of placenta got lodged in the lung of a pregnant woman? Would that impact the lung function? And obviously I'm thinking, well, I've been looking at blood clots that are getting stuck in the lung, and this looks kind of interesting stuff. Didn't actually really go anywhere, that research, but it did get me talking to people who love placentas. <laughs> so in 2012, I believe, I met uh, Joe James, who's uh, sat halfway through in the audience there, um, and she had returned reasonably recently from the UK, and we started to think about how we could apply some of those techniques that we'd come up with in lung research to placental research. And although I'd been applying for grants for a few years, it wasn't really until Joe and I got together that we started to get any grants. Um, so I was able to get a um, Aotearoa fellowship, um, which specifically was about kind of taking the research that I've done in lungs and bringing it back in time. So looking at young people's the lungs, uh, infants' lungs, and then placenta as well, and the Health Research Council the first grant, which was actually a respiratory grant, would be my last respiratory grant. Um, in 2012, um, we had our first ADI research forum. So I know Tora has uh, organised the very last um, predecessor to the research forum, which was um, termed a retreat. Um, and we decided that we probably wanted to do something that was a little bit more research focused. And so I actually thought this was much later on, but in 2012, a number of us, including Prasad and Paul Roberts, um, put together this first kind of um, research forum where we actually got together and talked about the work that we were doing in our groups. And we had Di there, Peter talking, and Richard Ball from the Centre for Brain research, so decided to get in with external speakers and actually interact with each other a little bit more and this is involved. Um, moving on from that, I started to, to kind of think about a little bit more about imaging of the centre and tissue of the uterus. And you can see in 2013, um, my photo of me at my desk is actually my photo, a photo of me at the micro CT machine. And this is when we started to do things like try to inject blood vessels with contrast media. Um, often two viscous contrast media in vessels that were too small to actually inject 
things in, um, but luckily Dane came along and we managed to get some successful imaging done um, in this region here is a um, blood vessel that resides at the interface between the mum's uterus and the placenta. And through that, um, Joe and I were able to get our first Marsden grant, a fast start grant. Um, and it turns out when I got that grant, when I got the phone call from Marsden, I had a bad back and I was off work at home and some unknown number phoned me to tell me I had this grant. And I seriously thought it was one of you guys pranking me. <laughs> but um, luckily it wasn't, it was real. <laughs> and we were able to start getting that research done. So through that we were able to get two new students into our group, um, Rojan and Wynne. And um, we're still working pretty closely with the respiratory group, so we've seen a few pictures from Christmas parties. This was the year, maybe in my adolescent form, that I decided that um, in the middle of summer, a pig onesie was the most festive thing that I could possibly imagine. So there's Marin and I uh, hanging out in our um, Christmas celebrations, which we don't really so much have anymore, but I started two years running in that Christmas um, show. And so um, that was right at the end of 2014. In 2015, I grew a giant tomato, which I'm pretty impressed by. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it really wasn't around the NBI that much, to be honest, so I don't know what you guys all up to. Um, but at, right at the end of the year, I started a Rutherford Discovery Fellowship, which was really what allowed all of this re research to accelerate. And there's been a few more little vegetables growing within the group. <laughs> uh, over the, that kind of, around about that period. So um, we've also achieved a much better family photo than I certainly have ever seen from my own family. <laughs> and so this is actually a slide that originated from my Rutherford Discovery Fellowship slides. Um, and that was kind of all about the group trying to find new ways to measure the anatomy of the placenta, new ways to look and how the cells in the placenta evolve and develop into forming that temporary organ that feeds the baby through pregnancy. Uh, new tools to analyze data and new ways to image blood flow. I'm not sure there is some great new, really, MRI imaging that I've been doing with Ali and Julia Peter Stone. And so, what is really great now, five years on from that 2015 being the end of my talk, is in that um, Rutherford Discovery Fellowship interview. Um, all those pictures were just generic things that I'd kind of pulled down from the internet or something, but now these are all our own pictures and we really have been doing good work in that area. Um, and tying it all together with the notion of a virtual pregnancy, so how we can take that anatomic data and that functional data and put it all together to understand a bit more about physiology and pregnancy health. And so um, this is what has evolved from those few members of the team uh, 10 years ago. Um, still have moments of adolescence, like at the mini golf uh, pub, um, but we now have a, a nice big group with all sorts of different backgrounds working with us, um, and including the MRI um, research with Ali and Peter. Oh, and that's the end of my talk. I thought there was one more, but I'm um, <laughs> going to talk. To coming to the University, uh, the University of Auckland and Biology and Chemistry. I've known of Peter Hunter, I've met Peter a number of times, in fact I've um, come out and tried to get a fellowship to come to the ABI, I was denied, that was when I was in Australia. So unfortunately I had to go to Stanford instead because I didn't get the fellowship. Um, it turned out that was actually probably not a bad thing to do. Um, this top picture is BioX, this is Stanford's kind of attempt, and I say attempt, and, um, of course 
it's very successful, of uh, bringing a lot of people together to work in multidisciplinary areas, particularly around biology. So emerging and engineering biology. It's right across from the hospital, fantastic resource. But when I got there, I was really intrigued because I was part of a research team, uh, really well regarded, well renowned research team, and just down the hall was another well regarded, fantastic research team. And I was the only person who actually attended both of the lab meetings. And in fact, I attended lab meetings of four different groups when I was there. It was just amazing, all these amazing people. But they were working in silos. And so, even though they had this fantastic resource and fantastic building, there was something missing there. There was a bit of collegiality kind of, kind of missing. So, I contacted Peter and said, look, uh, I've got two little vegetables of my own. Uh, I'd like those vegetables to, to grow up in New Zealand. Uh, and... Uh, he, he said, well, that's fine, and got back to me and said, well, when can you come? Was, this was December, I think, or well, November in 2010, and, and I said I can come straight away. So in January 2011, I arrived at um, the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Uh, and so, you know, the, from the outside, it may not look as fancy, but what's really important is what happens indoors, and, and this is the reason why there are so many people that you see in those photographs that Paul showed very early on that are still here today that haven't left and, and collegiality is, is a key thing. To bring up to speed about what else was going on in 2011, uh, I brought my family here in January and in February unfortunately there was a massive earthquake. We just left San Francisco Bay Area uh, and I said to my wife that we're, we're going to New Zealand, it's safe, it's a great place for kids to be. Uh, and then in March uh, this happened and that was a little bit further from home, but that was kind of scary. Then in May, there was a tornado that went through the North Shore. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh, it's not looking good. Um, and of course, winter is coming. <laughs> so, you know, not feeling terribly good about this move right now. Uh, that also, uh, that actually did start in, uh, in 2011 as well. But uh, uh, this is kind of a key thing that I've already said. It's a great quote, and interestingly, it came from a university magazine in 2009 from none other than Peter Hunter. And it's absolutely so true that collegiality is, is important, and it's exactly why we're all here today and why so many people uh, have, have failed to leave. So, <laughs> the, the nice thing is, of course, you've got to have international partners, no doubt, and we've done that, we've all gone abroad. We've got our international fix. Uh, unfortunately, COVID is a bit hard to do that, but we come back and we bring along those those uh, those connections. So it's fantastic that we, we have that. When I arrived, there was already a, a, a decent group of people doing musculoskeletal research, uh, particularly Vicky. It was kind of interesting. I was looking at an old photograph of Vicky, and the old photograph of Vicky ten years ago looked exactly the same. <laughs> this, this photograph that was taken last year, so I thought I'd just put this one up. <laughs> I'd known of the work uh, that Kuma was doing, also with Katja Oberhofer, if you recognise Katja there, of course Justin was there, uh, and also Dwayne Malcolm, these guys were doing some fantastic things. Of course, it's also nice to see Hayley there, who's returned as well, she's done her overseas thing, Jess Jordan. Uh, so there was already a good group of people there. Uh, and so I stepped in, there was a bunch of students who were doing great things as well. Uh, apologies to Alice, uh, you may not recognise Alice, that's her over here. Um, she was doing some work also with the uh, and, um, and since I have a picture of mustard and grey here, I'll just use the black and white photograph. <laughs> then, as Alice said, I was asked to, or was involved in the retreat. This is 2011 retreat, they used to be called retreats, and we no longer call them retreats. Uh, these were some slides that Kuma put together for, um, for discussing all of the things that were going on with research. And so here were the new researchers of 2011, and uh, I was fortunate enough to join the team, along with some other people you might recognise in this list. Um, there were some significant achievements apparently this year, mostly by Ian Anderson, and that hasn't changed. <laughs> so uh, the interesting, the one to note here is. Uh, <laughs> 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 Change that this is exactly as I went through last night with all these slides. Um, there was some cool horse stuff going on, and actually, we continue to do horse stuff with Glenn Ramsey. That was cool. Uh, I don't know if it's true about even and receiving calls from Peter Jackson either, but uh, of course, the ADI turned 10. Uh, there was another uh, presentation this time from Peng Du and talking about the postgraduate uh, report. 
this is kind of interesting because this is kind of the, the exact inverse of what we have today, where the majority of students back in 2011 um, were domestic students and not international. So let's hope through COVID we can kind of get back to our international standing, but I, I'm picking that we'll probably get back to a few more domestic students hanging around the ABI in the next couple of years. Um, for, for a group that was very collegial, there was, uh, there was a, a lot of interesting discussions uh, about the work environment. So apparently this was rated 7.9, I think that was out of 100. <laughs> um, in terms of desk space, noise, social space, uh, okay, you get the idea. There was, a, there was a few grumbles, which is why I think afterwards they said to Alice, look, let's not have a retreat, let's just call it a research forum and talk about all the good stuff, which is research. Which is research. Uh, give gave an overview of space and facilities. Question marks about level six referred. Has that been done? <laughs> <laughs> um, fifth floor was apparently very disorganised. Uh, they didn't know what to do. Maybe move people to the sixth floor, but of course that was messy. Uh, potentially we need a new building. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I haven't changed the slides. That this is uh, how they were coming basically. Uh, Rob talked about health and environment, and uh, of course there were significant issues here. Of course, we've grown teething problems from 20 to 170. Uh, I really like this bit: more personnel and less personal. Uh, <laughs> and sensible ways to sustain and improve our environment. We're kind of still looking at that. There were, apparently there were some problems with kitchens, uh, so that maybe continues today. And this is similar to the t-shirt Peter was wearing, but. Uh, one, you know, what can we do for the environment? Have one less coffee? Yeah, right. <laughs> that's not going to happen. Uh, Pete Blythe, who was running the workshop then, if you remember, Pete had some slides about all the new tools and toys and other things that continues, and the instrumentation group just keep getting more and more toys by the sounds of it. Their, their roles of nicely 3D printing materials going on here, some uh, happy students uh, making some other devices. Again, this was Ian's Playboy magazine. <laughs> uh, sorry, Tom, I'm sure that was more important. Jenny had an Elastima device uh, that was being created downstairs. Uh, there was TR's work was ongoing. This was before the merger with TR and Miller, so it was kind of TRM, which is um, um, a really nice merging, isn't it? TRM. Uh, there was some other stuff going on. I uh, don't understand any of that stuff that's going on, but it has something, something to do with Paul mentioning having icky materials and things on, on level 5, I believe. And there was a Faroe Island there that some people used, that's all fun and games. Kevin Daish, if you remember Kevin, had a uh, discussion about commercial activities. I, did, I took a lot of slides out because um, that was a bit of a downer that year of 2011. And one of the reasons why there was this fantastic initiative called eBones, if you remember that, um, there's Dwayne there, and um, he was kind of Doing, doing the hard yards of it on e-bones. I searched for e-bones actually last night, and the thing that's quite remarkable, it's now a new platform in which you can buy and sell anything anywhere in India. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, it's diverse, that's fine. It's, uh, it's uh, David Budget was talking about focusing, focusing, focusing on rats. Uh, I think he still does focus on rats. Um, and then, uh, we did have some commercial success, I have to put that out there. So, with, with Mark Pitch, mostly known for his moustache, in 2013, I think it was, he and I started I'm As You, which spun out, of course, from his work on inertial sensors. Uh, and later on, uh, 2014, we actually got funded from MB2 uh, with a smart idea, which uh, actually ended up being e Bones version 2. We didn't tell him that, but ended up kind of being like that and we got funded for a couple of years and, and Jude had finished his PhD and went on to create Forbes Labs in 2016 that was kind of spun out of the university. Uh, last slide, and I've said this before in my talk earlier in the year, you know, you surround yourself by good people and good things will happen. And so we've had a really lucky, or I feel we've been lucky to be surrounded by lots of good people. Uh, still lots of exciting things going on. There's now maybe 35 of us in the musculoskeletal group, so we've gone strength to strength, and uh, I'm going to call it the SM. I've got 10 minutes, maybe. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>
Yeah, Alice told me that she and Tor love to talk. Okay, we had a good demonstration, which was very interesting. So uh, now we move to our second keynote speaker, Dr. Samantha Holtwell. Ms. Ham is a senior lecturer at FMHS, but she's also the CEO and director of research at the Brandon Matai uh, Medical Imaging Center, his call. So although Sam is not part of API, she has very strong ties with the institute and collaborates with many of us. Um, and some have already spent time in this and in Matai, and some of the wind company will probably uh, have the opportunity to go at, at one point. Um, so Sam is a medical physicist. She has expertise in magnetic resonance imaging with a special focus on the brain. Um, so after more than 10 years at Stanford, she's not the only one who went to Stanford and came back to New Zealand. So she came back in uh, 2018 and has embarked on a journey to obtain funding for Matai, which was uh, officially opened a few months ago. Um, she's an expert in high resolution MR imaging and has developed techniques such as the amplified MRI. And I'm sure you have a lot to tell us about Matai, about traumatic brain injury, and about collaboration with JDI. Thank you for Thank coming. Thank you so much. So it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm just really honoured to be able to be invited to this, to this session and, and talk to you today. And I'm really um, in part of, of, I feel as though being part of the celebration is really um, inspiring. It's just incredible to how far the ABI has come in 20 years. It's inspiring for me, it's inspiring for Marta. I just really, through this talk, would really like to celebrate some of the growing relationships that Natai has with ABI. We rely on ABI a lot in the projects that we're doing, so I uh, just want to celebrate some of those. You can see this by this, some of the beautiful imagery that we'll show. Um, you can see your very own Miriam, PhD student here, who's used some of the data from the Natai scanner to develop these beautiful visualisations of the brain, and, and you'll see some of those throughout the, throughout the talk. And so, Thanks to Samuel for letting me have this very, very weird title with lots of M's. Um, it's really, but really what I want to talk about is some of the big picture stuff uh, through the research that we're developing with, with ABI. Mm -hmm. But first up, uh, four years ago when I came back from the overseas, about 16 years, as part of my interview for the University of Auckland, um, one of, my, one of my very first interviews or visits was actually at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. And this is where I got to meet these three amazing people. And I've met lots of amazing people since then. And my first thoughts were, I think I've just met the smartest, most humble people I've ever met. All, and they all seem to be in the same building. Floors and floors of, of people who are doing cool things, with great technology, really great impactful research. And they keep all here in this amazing conference. Just going back to what Thor has said about, I was at Stanford for 11 years and I really did notice those silos um, between these amazing expert groups. But what you've got is lots of expert groups in one building, all working very closely in a really um, great cultural environment. And I, I just really noticed that within minutes of being at Auckland Bioengineering Institute. And then I got introduced to your coffee machine. <laughs> and that was, I thought, gosh, I bet this thing can flush the moon because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty neat. So, so, yeah, after that meeting, I was really determined to come back to the University of Auckland and do what it takes. So, through my role at Auckland at Matai, um, wasn't, Matai wasn't around then, but through my roles, trying to build up relationships with you wonderful people at the Auckland Bay Engineering Institute. So, some of you may not have heard of Matai. So, what we are is a medical research institute which is based on the east coast of the North Island in Gisborne, Tairapati. Uh, it's funded by the Provincial Growth Fund. And it's really been quite a massive undertaking. We've um, officially opened the doors in September of 2020. And here we are here, we've got a little modular building with a state-of-the-art 3D MRI system, which is in the heart of the Gisborne Hospital, right here in the heart of the hospital. And so it actually only houses about one person, it's very small, but we have a, an, a, another location off site where we house the researchers. And it's really wonderful to have this research in the area that, that is an area of, of, need, of need here. We've got high rates of chronic illness in, and, uh, in, in our area. And we're really 
felt overwhelmed by the community response here. We felt that Mount High, through this process of sort of consultation with the community, we really are a community organisation that um, that really has captured the heart of the community, particularly Māori, who led the opening of our ceremony. I just want to thank there's a lot of faces in the audience here, um, running right, right there, who came down to be part of our opening. There's a lot of ABI people who are there to support us, and we really we won't forget that. So, so thank you. So here's the system that we've got. It's a three Tesla MRI system. It's a wide board, it's 70 centimetres, so it's 10 centimetres larger than what you typically used to, which is which doesn't sound like much, but it feels like a much more spacious system. And it's really high-end hardware and software. We're always going to be kept up to, to date for our links with GE Global. And um, I've worked for quite a lot of these scanners and precursors to, of these scanners in my days back at Sanford. And this one here is really next level. It can go really fast, get really high-end images. This is an example of an image that was acquired in five minutes using simultaneous multi-slice diffusion intensity MRI. And uh, the system itself is designed for NFL players, so to fit larger players in order to try and buy markers for specifically for concussion. And our second purchase was a cloth machine inspired by the ABI, several orders of magnitude cheaper, but it's just as important for us as well. So this is one of the big pieces of technology that we're finding really, really exciting. Uh, this is a receiver coil that captures the signal off the body that you need to get good MRI images. And the first thing you're taught usually with MRI is you can't overlap these coils because they'll cause all sorts of problems. But this is no longer an issue with these. This is an air coil that can wrap, it can squeeze, you can wrap it around a baby, wrap it around an arm or a leg. And, uh, and it's, it's much more comfortable. We're really enjoying this, this, this coil. We've got different versions of this, one for the body, uh, we've got a smaller version for the shoulder, one for the knee, and so forth. And that technology is also in our heat coil as well for high end brain imaging. Now, in terms of our research projects, and in particular, these are, I've focused on the ones that we're, we're really working in collaboration with uh, ABI on. These, we've got a concussion project at Tara, we're coming to Tara to study amplified MRI and prostate cancer. But all of these are at various stages of. Um, of um, various stages, and this particular one here, of course I won't talk about that, but this is a study that will be starting in, in June around a 10 minute MRI protocol that we're using to help screen for prostate cancer and target biopsies in, the, in an area that we, it doesn't, we, don't have a, we only have a visiting urologist, so this is a sort of a paradigm changing idea that we've got there, led by Dr. Dean Cornfield, who's the study here from Marta. So we've got these other projects that I, I want to I talk about that we're doing in collaboration with, with ABI. So this first one here is concussion. So we've been forming, doing a lot of work in concussion to build up our knowledge of, of concussion. And just a bit of background, there's really no reliable objective test for con concussion, which really hinders the reliable treatment and management options. And so we've formed a group where the it's a quite a collaborative group that is looking at multiple the concussion of multiple aspects, including imaging, brain injury simulation, external biomarkers, and RNA. And uh, my po mine and Vicky's postdoc here in Pond, who's both Marti and ABI, is someone who's got a, an overview of all of these and she's leading a lot of these projects and, and actually doing a lot of field work for these projects. So for the past four or five months of having the scanner, we spent a long time just developing a really high-end, fast MRI protocol to look at various aspects of the brain, from structure to function to physiology, so that we can all search for a biomarker, a global objective biomarker of concussion. And we've got things ranging from diffusion imaging, looking at as a proxy for white matter and fiber integrity, looking at 4D flow, major vessels so to understand changes in blood flow. Here's amplified MRI, which I'll talk about. Functional MRI, looking at um, different changes in different cognitive networks as might occur and we get whacked on the head. This one here is a really fast form of functional where we're not doing static analysis, we're doing dynamic changes in function in real time. And looking at structural and also MR spectroscopy, which looks at brain metabolites. This is the case here is lactate, we're looking at lactate again. This is multi-box spectroscopy. We've 
also got an ASL segment which was looks at cerebral blood flow as well as QSC which looks at microbleeds and potential changes in myelin integrity as well. And the ABI team that we rely that we rely on, we are relying on for this is Alan Wang, Vicky, Mary and, and Grace, and uh, you know, because we've got these multi-modalities and ABI is very well positioned to be able to work with us to to extract some of these biomarkers from these multi-modal imaging methods. And so this is some of Vicky's work here. So we've just started to study with Gisborne Boys High first 15 and second 15. And we are actually, as we speak, having these, these kids being equipped with mouth guards. These are mouth guards from a company in Australia called Hit IQ, which have three sensors in the mouth guard and they pick up the impacts of the head in, in real time. And what we're doing is we're scanning the players with that MRI protocol at the moment, their baseline scans, and we're going to be scanning them after they've had an impact and also after the season. And here's some proof of concept data that Vicky has developed on data sets in collaboration with a group in Queens, Canada, on the American football players to show that we can simulate this brain injury patterns in, uh, in just two minutes. We're also doing eye tracking. We're collecting saliva to look at RNA markers of brain injury and doing cognitive tests. And this is really the first ever research that we know of where we have so many multi modalities in, in one single cohort. So we're really excited about this project, which has just started sort of the last couple of weeks. So I want to mention the Tidakati study, which has quite a lot of relevance to many groups here. So this is a little pilot that we're going to be um, piloting in the, in, the, in the upcoming months. So what is it? So it's a, it's a long-term study that we're planning to do to follow a cohort of children. We're talking, we're wanting to target seven-year-old children. We might have to bring it up. We want to target seven-year-old children and follow them through their lives with high-end MRI imaging. And the idea here is to scan the kids from the head to the waist collect data from multiple organ systems, the brain, the heart, the vascular system, liver, the kidney, the musculoskeletal system, and represent our population, which is 50% Māori, 50% non-Māori, 50% female and male. And so why are we keen to do that? And we're keen to come up with predictive and preventive measures of various illnesses. So here's a different imaging we're going to be doing. See so these brain imaging, we've got Brain protocol that we've developed in collaboration with Sarush and Gonzalo. Liver and kidney imaging, vascular system, muscle sleep imaging, and cardiac imaging. We've also got a really high end retinal camera that takes a nice picture of the back of the retina and the vascular system in a couple of seconds, so we'll be collecting eye data as well. And if you want to talk a little bit more about that with any of the team, we've got Dan here, we've got Robbie here and Lee, so please get this Robbie back there waving his hand. So go and see Robbie if you're interested in this study because we're building it right now. We're co-designing it with Māori and we'd love to co-design it with people from Auckland Bioengineering Institute. So Sarish and Gonzalo has already, already been down and we've worked together to come up with a set of imaging methods which we is within our scan type constraints while also having the data they need to create their virtual brain models. And here we've got vascular images, we've got woody flow images, diffusion images, and amplifying MRI images. And all of this is in order to develop a brain model to represent the effects of blood flow and brain structure alterations that are characteristic to the brain disorders so that we can um, lead to predictive and personalised medicine for the brain. So we've got the brain protocol sorted, which is quite a comprehensive one. It's going to take 30 minutes on the brain, we have to pull the kids out for a little break and then we do the rest of the body in 30 minutes, so it's an hour total scan time. We're also collecting, uh, initially we're just collecting images from the head to the waist, but then we had a lovely visit from Thor and Ali, and uh, this is when um, Alice and Peter Stone were down as well. And, um, and we realised that maybe this might be helpful for musculoskeletal modelling, and so we just added on an extra minute, and we can now get the waist, the feet in one extra minute, so we thought we'd probably add that one on too. So in two minutes we can get this type of image, um, which we hope, and we, we want to get that feedback to see whether this is good enough data to help with the musculoskeletal modeling that, that your, your experts at. So I just want to move on to the uh, amplifying MRI that we're developing at Martai. 
So just a little bit of background on amplified MRI. So this is a method where we take a standard Cine MRI, which is like an MRI movie. So this is an MRI of the, uh, which represents the brain movement in one cardiac beat. Now, it's a bit of background. The brain doesn't, as you know, doesn't move very much, and the resolution of the MRI is such that you can't see that motion with the naked eye. And so we've developed, not developed, we've actually just taken the, a, a, the MIT algorithm, which amplifies real-world video, uh, images of real-world videos, and we've just applied that to MRI to amplify the motion of the brain as the heart beats. And the idea here is to try and help us understand about what goes on inside the brain with different diseases and disorders, and that the underlying disorders that different diseases have different um, effect, make affect brain motion. And being able to amplify this motion, it could be a completely new way of looking at brain brain health. And so, this is the algorithm that it's based off. It's just an algorithm you can get it off the um, MIT website, which just simply just takes real world videos and amplifies that motion as the head wobbles around. And we can apply it to different disease that so this is preliminary data showing a normal child, a four-year-old boy, with a four-year-old boy who has something called Chiari malformation. And Chiari malformation is when the cerebellar tonsils sort of drop down and block the flow of the CSF, which is all this white stuff. Um, and to make the brain move in a slightly different way, and you can see that the brain kind of moves in, in a very strange sort of it's more mid-brain motion, more piston-like motion, more frontal lobe motion, which is kind of consistent to what is expected. And so that's very preliminary data to suggest that um, brain performance <coughs> obstructions can alter the motion of the brain. And it's all very well that um, we can visualise this motion, but I was really um, excited when I had this chat with, with Paul and his team about his his algorithm that we've been using. I mean, Paul's been using this for lots of different other, other applications, ranging from from airplanes to um, to OCT data and things like that. And um, we, we can use this basic image register. You know, it's an image registration tool which picks up subvoxel motion without having to amplify the motion. And uh, yeah, so this is an example of that same data she said showing a normal brain, and there's this one with the Chiari, you can see the motion is elevated in these places here where you would expect. So we're very excited to see that. This is a, a different way of looking at the brain. Here is the website. So this is now, there's actually a demo here where you can upload your images, whether it be MRI images or OCT images with some you know, time series of images, and you can extract that these motion or these displacement maps that um, information on these maps that um, that give you an idea about how much the movement there has been subvoxel. And there's many, many opportunities to exploit this algorithm. And this group's looking for PhD students because uh, there's lots and lots that can be done with this with this algorithm. So please go to Paul if, if you're interested in, in that algorithm. We've got lots of other collaborative projects with from my journey ones, there's two ones that are well under development. There's the ADHD and fidgeting study with uh, Justin Fernandez, fascia imaging study with, with Jeff, and I, I really love this ADHD study. This is an example of a study that came through our pilot research program, and this whole idea here is that uh, the hypothesis that Justin put forward is that kids who fidget. Um, there's a good reason for them to fidget, and that is that they want to, you know, they're there to try and prove, fidget to try and prove their focus, their the executive function in the frontal lobe. And so this, while this is very early preliminary data, here's some data to suggest that if you fidget, if you have ADHD and you fidget, uh, based on functioning on MRI, you get improved blood flow to the frontal lobe, improved executive function, and therefore improved attention and focus. That matches that more of a typical brain. And uh, as a result of this, this project, um, this very preliminary project, uh, now Justice has gone in for a, a collaborative mastering grant, which is a really example of how we've really enjoyed this. And he's included our cultural advisor, as well as Māori PhD scholarships. And um, we're really excited about this particular outcome of this particular project that actually didn't take long to pull off. So, so that's pretty neat. And we've got one with Keith Hunsfield as well, where we're looking at the fascia tissue to look at muscle development. And this is a sequence that 
is called ultra short echo time imaging, which is actually available on a lot of other scanners as well. And the idea here is in one sequence you can get two images with different types of contrast. One here with an echo time of which we call the echo time of the first echo has a different type of contrast to the second image. If we subtract them, we can get the fascia tissue. And from these the fascia tissue images, Jeff and his team have created a model of fascia tissue. And the whole clinical application here is for muscle development and cerebral, uh, cerebral palsy. It's another exciting project that is going to be also run, uh, run at NASA in collaboration with or combined engineering. So we've got those hours, there's lots to talk about. These are some other examples where we're working with, um, with Thor and Julie and Justin to look at muscle skeletal opportunities, Alice, Peter and Ali to look at fetal development. And now that we've just got our software for Emma for cardiac, body flow and, and our cardiac software packages, already we're really keen to reunite our conversations with Martin and Prasad and Kat, um, Yemi and Julian around uh, heart disease. We've got very high rates of cardiomyopathies and cardiopathy and we're really keen to figure out how we can make a difference in, in, in our region uh, with regard to heart disease. So if you're interested in, in coming through Martai, we've got this pilot program here and um, you can talk with, with Lee, who's over there. Lee, can you put your hands up? So any questions about, about that pilot or anything you about Martai in general, you can go to Lee. And here, what we, um, what we do here is just simply give four hours of scan time and we just have to, have to, it has to have academic merit and ability to, for us as well to be able to pull it off and um, as a requirements around vision uh, market on as well. So I uh, just want to thank um, the ABI, some of the ABI people who came down to the Gisborne a &P show. So last year we had our a &P show, and this is a rural show that goes just around the rural areas, and I've been to these shows for the last 35 years, and they usually have tractors and wood chopping and gum boot throwing, and we had a tent where the ABI brought all of their fancy devices, and absolutely mind-blowing for our people, and the kids loved it, the community loved it. Uh, Centre for Brain Research was there, and we, we won the best site in the show, so we really, that was pulled off partly because of because of you guys who came down, so many thank you for that. Several familiar faces here, right there. So, um, yeah, big thank you to all our funders and supporters. And just a, a, another little picture from Dawn Mary, who's developed this award winning image processing uh, of the brain here. And uh, we look forward to, um, to, to working more with, with ABI. Here's the Mantai Fano, so we've I've kind of claimed some people here, but um, we've got some, here's our team, we've got a wonderful board of trustees and a, a, a Māori advisory board as well, and uh, these guys are the ones that are here today, Lee's over there, Dan is over there, he's our clinical lead, radiologist, Hari is our Kiwi scientist, scientist, so um, Claire Lynx here with ABI, and Robbie is the lead on the Tai Aki study, he's back here, so, so please feel free to come up to any of us uh, after that, after this talk. Um, yeah, I just want to celebrate you and thank you so much all the ABI people we've met up and you have got to know them all on this list and I'm um, looking forward to getting to know more of you wonderful people and uh, with that I'd like to thank you and congratulate ABI for coming this far, so far in only 20 years. It's just really inspiring. You've come for us to inspire you as well. Thank you.
So it's currently a PI in the bio, bio mechanics of breast imaging group, and he will tell us what increasing collaboration is going on by from Mark and in your group on the application of augmented reality to the diagnosis of breast cancer. That's that. X-ray mammography, where the breast is compressed between two plates uh, to produce 2D images where you can identify microcalcifications. There's also MRI imaging that's performed when you're lying prone up on your front. And, uh, and, and this um, identifies uh, sort of uh, this identifies the uh, blood vessels around around tumors. Um, and we also have ultrasound imaging, which is performed on your back <coughs> while the ultrasound probe is pressed against the skin. So studies have shown that if you map information between these different medical images, you can strengthen diagnosis of the disease. However, this is quite a challenge for clinicians um, because of the varying degrees of deformation each imaging procedure applies to the breast. So uh, for instance, here's an example. Just to find, to co-locate something in an MRI uh, with an ultrasound. So basically doing an ultrasound to confirm what has been seen in an MRI could take up to an hour. And if they can't find the corresponding point in an hour, then they have to give up because that's sort of the resource allocation. Um, so what we are aiming to do is sort of uh, develop, use physics-based modeling to try and help address this um, some of these challenges. And the idea here is that we want to use the concept of, of developing biomechanical models that will be able to, we can use these models to simulate the deformation that occurs during each imaging procedure. For example, we can simulate a, mam a mammographic compression, we can simulate how the breast tissues change shape as you change position. And the idea here is that as, as we move into each of these different uh, imaging, uh, the, sort of the the imaging, uh, what's happening during the imaging procedures, we can embed these images into the model and use the model as a way to integrate all the information together. Right, so the idea here is that these models can be used to improve uh, the diagnosis of, uh, of breast cancer. Now, if we've identified the location of a tumor, we need to be able to predict where that where those tumors would move to during different treatment procedures, such as surgery or radiotherapy. Now the problem is that uh, these, the breast tissues, they deform quite substantially. So it's very hard to predict where they move, especially, especially when you don't have imaging, some sort of image guidance. And that is unavailable during these, uh, these um, procedures. So what we're aiming to do is also use our biomechanical models to help predict where these uh, tumors move to during the different treatment procedures. So our overall vision of our group is to use physics-based modeling to help improve outcomes for breast cancer patients. And we're trying to do this by developing these uh, automated image processing workflows. Um, and we're aiming to sort of make sure we can translate these into the clinic. So this requires them to be, as I mentioned, fully automated and also run, uh, and we're doing our best as we can, try and run them in, in real time. And because we really want to base this on good solid engineering, our, our, um, we, we want to make sure that all the techniques we develop are verified and we have very strong sort of validation. We want to ensure that we're, we're, we're getting the results that um, we expect. Um, and the idea there is that once we develop these workflows, we can uh, include them in pilot studies to demonstrate whether they're doing what we expect and if they are, start trying to apply them in large scale uh, clinical trials. 
So I'll give you an overview of uh, one, of the, one of the workflows that we've developed. Um, and this involves obtaining medical images from the hospital. In this case, it's an MRI image. And what we, what we do is we perform a series of steps. Uh, the first step is performing segmentation. So now we take these medical images and we extract the boundaries of the tissues that we're interested in. And so we've developed uh, machine learning tools with the aid of uh, Gonzalo here to, to be able to extract boundaries of interest, such as the skin or the outer rib, which are quite important for uh, biomechanics simulations. And we can, we can do this fairly quickly at the moment. So we're extending this approach at the moment to, to you know, extract as many of the tissues as, as we can that we, are, we, uh, we believe are important for breast biomechanics. So once we have the segmentation, what we can do is we can extract out, uh, the we, we, can, we can generate points from the boundaries of these uh, segmentations and we get ourselves a point cloud. What we can do with this is then fit mathematical service to that and that's where this anatomical modeling step comes in. So to do this, what we've done is we've developed approaches that use statistical shape models to provide an initial estimate. So we use information from the population to get an initial estimate of what the shape would look like. We then use traditional uh, geometric fitting approaches to sort of fine tune that so it's very uh, personalized to that individual. And we found that this approach is quite, uh, we can automate this approach in this manner and it's very robust to missing data and noise in the images. So once we've constructed our anatomical model, we want to be able to perform simulations with this model. So for example, we can perform a compression simulation to sort of uh, determine where uh, the breast tissues would move under, under compressive load, such as during uh, mammography. Or we can simulate how the breast tissues uh, change uh, in position as you reorient a person, for example, from when they're lying on their front to lying on their back. And when they're lying on their back, that's the position that, um, you know, that's the position where surgery and radiotherapy procedures are performed. So once we've performed our simulations, we need, we need to be able to present the results of our, uh, our workflows uh, and, and, the, and the, you know, the new information provided by our models. We need to be able to present that in a way that's easy for clinicians to interact and uh, understand the, the results that we're providing. And once we've developed these visualizing tools, we want to make these available in the clinic such that clinicians can use that, this new information, to help improve diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. So uh, together with our clinical collaborators at Open City, uh, uh, together with our clinical collaborators, we've implemented a prototype of this workflow, a fully automated workflow at Open City Hospital. And here's an example of the visualization tool that we've developed. So, uh, what I'm showing here is uh, a slice of our diagnostic uh, prone MRI image, so that's taken in this position, and, and the associated model that we've automatically constructed from those images. And on the right here, I'm showing the, um, the prediction from our workflow of where the tissues would have moved to when you're lying on your back, such as where surgery or radiotherapy procedures are performed. So a clinician can can scroll through these images and click on any point they're interested in and will tell them where that point would move to from that prone position, the diagnostic, uh, uh, the diagnostic position, to uh, where treatment is performed in that supine position. So, so that sort of gives you an overview of the workflow that we've developed. And to, to actually, actually develop this, we ended up having to collect uh, quite a bit of data. So we, we obtained um, images from 114 healthy participants, and we, we, we tried to get as high resolution as we could, and try to be able to see all the boundaries. And we got these images in both the prone and the supine position. So this really helped us develop these workflows. Um, and then we also, with the help of Anthony Doyle, um, our, our, our uh, clinician, we also obtained data from over 200 uh, breast cancer patients where we have Oh, and prone MRI, um, X-ray mammograms, and ultrasound. And, and, and so we needed to make sure that our methods also work on these images. And uh, you can see the difference between these, these two images. And our methods are able now to build models from these and actually make biomechanics simulations, uh, predictions. 
So, so what I'll do now is just give you an idea of what we're currently working on and how we're trying to extend these workflows, especially in terms of improving the simulation. So while we've got this workflow up and running, uh, the predictions for the mechanics are quite basic at the moment because we haven't include, included any uh, uh, much of the internal tissues, and that's one of our um, one of our goals. Uh, we also we also will find that MRIs aren't always acquired, uh, so we need to be able to build these uh, models without MRI and try and integrate information from ultrasonic mammograms. Uh, and we want to also be able to validate our workflows and make sure they're doing what we expect. And I'll finish up just giving a, a vision for how we can start using mixed reality uh, technologies uh, in, in, in future clinical uh, workflows. So the first thing we're trying to do at the moment is to, well, before we, before we do that, if, if you look at this image here, you, you're seeing the anatomy of the breast. And what we're seeing here is that the breast tissue is sitting on the pectoral muscle, which is attached to the arm. In turn, the arm is attached to the shoulder. So as soon as you sort of move the arm or the shoulder, the breast tissues will, you know, the position of the breast tissues will be influenced, and therefore any tumor within the breast tissue will also uh, move. And, and so that's actually quite an important interaction that we need to include in our models. And here's an example of where that's quite important. In, for example, radiotherapy, when that's performed, the arm has to be moved away from the body so that you don't irradiate the arm. Um, and it's the same sort of uh, issue in, in surgery as well. So our models at the moment don't even include the arms. They, they, don't, they don't include any mechanism for us to be able to change the skeleton. So what we've been doing is, uh, we've been, um, this is what Kirja, one of our master's students, have been looking at, is going through these images and actually pulling out uh, joint locations and, and, um, and landmarks. And through this process, we developed uh, we've used uh, you know, the really useful, you know, great tools that the musculoskeletal community has been developing to construct uh, skeletal models along, you know, directly from our MRI images. So these, this procedure is now automated and it can also predict missing joints. So in, in this manner, what we could do is we can actually analyze the, the changes in the skeleton between the cone and supine positions from our images because we have imaged people with their, you know, with, uh, in the prone position and the supine position. So this is, this is helping us understand how these skeletal structures uh, are, are changing. Um, we've also, this is really useful because now underneath the hood of our models, we can have an embedded skeleton, which we can use to drive the motion of the soft tissues. For example, when the arm is moved uh, aside. So that's one of the things we improve. The other thing is also, uh, the concept of the mechanical properties of the tissues. Now we're using biomechanics simulations to try and make predictions. That's actually, uh, so in our models we have parameters that define the stiffness of the different tissues, because this is a, a fully predictive model. As you put, uh, you know, if you, if you don't specify the correct stiffness, for example, you say one of the tissues is uh, twice as stiff, when you make predictions, the tumor won't move as much as it should. And this can really influence the ability to make accurate predictions. So uh, what we need to do is develop methods to be able to identify these mechanical properties. And, and this is quite a difficult task because these properties vary spatially, uh, between the different tissues, even within tissues, temporally with the age of the individual, <coughs> and also with the state of the tissue itself. So we're interested in some of these uh, identifying the properties of some of these tissues, such as the fiber dental tissue, the fat, the muscle, and even the skin. So how do we identify these properties? Well, the current, yeah, so what you really need to do is you need to be able to measure a change in the shape of the, of the tissue under a known load. So the current state of the art, and I should, I should add that with this information, we can use our models themselves to try and identify these uh, parameters. So the current state of the art is actually to obtain a prone MRI image and a supine MRI image. Image. This is what this is what's done in, in research, and because now you have two states, you, you can uh, see the deformation in both those states, and you know the load, the sort of the, the, the load, and that's from gravity. So with that, with this information, you can actually identify mechanical properties. 
The problem with this is, as we said before, is that it requires a supine MRI, which is not clinically available. Now, to add to this, uh, add to this issue, sometimes even the prone, well, not sometimes, most of the time, the prone MRI image is also not available. So even in Auckland here, only 10% of patients have prone MRI image. And this is because while this imaging modality is high sensitivity, it has low specificity, meaning there's a lot of false positives. So this imaging modality is only used in cases uh, where there's high risk. For example, if the breast tissues are dense and you can't get a good mammogram, uh, mammogram images, or if there's a high risk of uh, family sort of a, a history of breast cancer. So what we need is alternative methods to be able to image the breast uh, to allow us to construct anatomical models, because we won't, might not have the MRI images, and also estimate mechanical properties. So one way of getting this data is to obtain uh, measurements from the surface of the body, skin surface. And there's a number of uh, commercial uh, devices out there that allow you to get access to this data. Data for everything from laser scanners to depth cameras, and a number of these are already used uh, in the clinic. We ourselves we've actually developed um, imaging rigs, very um, uh, imaging rigs that are, can reconstruct uh, shapes to very high accuracies. And not only that, not only not only to provide uh, providing high accuracy reconstruction of shape. We can also, we develop algorithms to be able to track deformation of the tissues. For example, as you move, you can track that tissue uh, deformation uh, and use that information, this uh, information, to try and uh, help identify mechanical properties. So these, these tools really allow us to generate, effectively generate shape information, such as a point cloud. And we've shown, I've shown in a part of our workflow, we actually developed a method using statistical shape modeling and geometric fitting to be able to fit uh, meshes, anatomical models, to these data sets. And we found that this was quite, it was automatic and robust. The problem with this is that, one of the limitations here is that we, we developed these models using spe a specific uh, um, you know, set of images, which were images uh, generated when the person was lying prone. And so these statistical models won't actually work when you have arbitrary positions. And so what we need to do is be able to generalize this approach such that we can construct anatomical models when we have a, pers a, a patient positioned in any, any sort of orientation, whether it's prone, supine, upright. Um, and so a number of groups around the world have been developing such systems. For example, uh, to, systems to collect this data. Uh, for example, um, Mac, the Max Planck Institute have developed systems with 22 cameras that will allow them to uh, get you know, dynamic data sets which contain the shapes of individuals across different people and different poses. That's just one, uh, one of the data sets available. There's many out there. And on top of that, uh, there's also been a lot of groups that have developed methods. For example, here's one from Google Research. Uh, and they've developed methods that can automatically construct uh, personalized models from, uh, from this data, for example, point clouds. And the process of building these models involves identifying the pose of the individual. So from that skin surface, they can estimate the skeleton. So what we are aiming to do here is try and extend the, uh, the state of the art to address some of the challenges with these models. The first thing is that the, the skeletons that are used here are typically not anatomically accurate. They, the, the purpose of these models is typically aimed towards the animation industry. So we need to be able to make use of, um, we want to be able to incorporate an accurate, uh, sort of anatomically, anatomically accurate skeleton. And we can do that by integrating these techniques with the techniques we've developed for analyzing MRI images, where we can see all the skeletal structures. So that's one, one item. The other item is also that these, just like the skeleton, the reason why they can't model the skeleton well is because you only get information from the surface of the body. So you don't know what's happening on the internal tissue. So what we need to also do is be able to develop techniques to predict the internal tissue boundaries from only surface measurements. 
So once we, once we can do that, then we can apply our, you know, we can form just skin surface measurements, we'll be able to construct anatomical models and use the data as well to identify mechanical properties so we can perform our biomechanics simulations. So the, all of this, all of the, what I've shown you here is great in theory, but how about when we come to uh, sort of uh, use these techniques? We need to make sure that each of the techniques that we're developing uh, you know, gives us the, the, the result that we expect. So to do that, we, we're really developing uh, you know, uh, systems to allow us to validate our models. So in addition to acquiring MR images, we are also developing uh, a new rigged image movement in multiple positions, such as the upright, so in this case the, the individual sits in the seat and we can then you know, manually rotate that seat into different positions, such as when a person's on their back or prone. And the idea here is that we're also providing a, a ways to be able to hold the arms in different positions, which are relevant for clinical, um, you know, for in the clinical application. So we can actually look at how changes in the arm positions influence the, the shape of the, of the breast. The idea here is to attach camera systems to this frame so we can gather rich data to validate generation of the models and being able to predict mechanical uh, behavior. And, in, and this will also allow us to uh, assess our ability to, to estimate mechanical problems. So together with our, so we're collaborating on this work with Breast Research Australia who have you know, extensive experience in imaging women. And they have all the community links to be able to perform this imaging both in New Zealand and in Australia. Okay, so this, this gives us you know, a really useful tool to be able to construct models and estimate mechanical properties so we can make simulations. How do we actually bring this back into the clinic? And what, so our current clinical workflow is, is just obtaining images that are already available in the clinic. But we envision that soon in the future, we should be able to access uh, more newer technology, for example, uh, technology involving mixed reality, techno uh, mixed reality tools. Uh, for example, um, here's an example of one such device called the Micro Color Lens, which you can wear on your head, and it actually provides the sensors to be able to generate these point clouds of individuals. Now, this, for example, um, can be used in the, in the hospital where a clinician is wearing this, and they use they can look at the, uh, you know, the, the, the patient and align a model. A model could be aligned to the body, and uh, you know, it provides the data to automatically sort of to, to, to align a, a model to the, to the patient. And then, not only that, it also has this visor that would project information onto the visor. For example, you can actually project the tumor location. So as, as the clinician is moving, they can see where the tumor is on the patient directly. And so studies have been performed, uh, for example, a, a group at Stanford have actually uh, used this device uh, to, you know, to test the feasibility of this. So what they did was they performed uh, a supine, um, they, they, prior to surgery, they obtained supine MRI images. So that's lying in your back, similar position you would expect. And then they generated a model of the breast and the, and the tumor from, from the MRI images. And then what they did was during that surgery, at the beginning of the surgery, what they did was they used a marker-based approach to align the MRI, the model, and the tumor from those, uh, you know, from the pre, you know, the, the previous imaging. They used, to, they used that to align the model to the patient. And they tried, they, they projected the tumor on the patient and they tried to see are they getting a good uh, match to where the tumor is relative to other approaches, for example, type health patients? And they found that actually their results weren't that great. And it turns out that despite the fact that the MRI is also imaged when you're lying on your back, there's changes in the skeletal structures that has, has resulted in uh, the actual position of the tumors changing. And they actually said, well, if we had a biomechanics workflow, this would be very useful. 
and it happened that they didn't have that at that stage. So, so, um, so this is where our sort of expertise would come in, where we could we could start using the the you know the workflows that we're developing to try and fill in that gap. And just to show, we we started looking into this area and performing some validation experiments. So, for example, here uh, this is where we had a student, uh, Robin Levin, who who came along and uh, developed a markerless approach. And we applied this to silicon gel phantoms, and what this approach can do is automatically align models to point clouds from cameras such as the HoloLens. And we can get really good sort of alignments between the model and the, the data. Then, not only that, we've also developed approaches to track the surface deformation using these models as you perform indentate, uh, you know, some sort of perturbation to the system, be that gravity or uh, indentation, for example, by ultrasound probe. So this really gave us some, some confidence that we can actually uh, use the tools here. Now what we actually, what we need to do now is sort of start to incorporate the mechanics underlying the, you know, into these, into the systems. And we've already made a good start on that. Uh, with Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo and I have developed ways to be able to run our mechanics simulations in real time now. And we, we've also extended that approach using machine learning techniques and we've also I extended that approach so we can also estimate mechanical properties very quickly. So we can do that now in a couple of seconds. Um, so what we aim to do is integrate this with the imaging, uh, the imaging systems that we've been developing here, to and, and demonstrate that on volunteers in future years. So that gives you a kind of an overview of how we plan to, uh, how do we see this work um, sort of moving in the future. So in summary, we've developed automated biomechanics workflows to help clinicians diagnose and treat breast cancer, and we're doing a range of different uh, studies at the moment to validate and make some clinical contributions uh, in, in the short term based on the, on the rich data sets that we, that we have available. Now, in the future, what we want to do is start incorporating uh, information from ultrasound images, mammograms, and ultimately even move the technology we're developing from the clinic to industry as well. So I'd like to really thank our funding sources, uh, without whom you know, we wouldn't be able to do this work, and also our clinicians, especially Anthony Doyle, who has been with us from the beginning of this project and provided us you know, with, with, uh, with a lot of guidance. Um, and of course our clinical collaborators and, and, and the students, I mean, this, and, and they are really the reason why this work is quite enjoyable. Interacting with our students and collaborators is what really uh, you know, makes this work sort of exciting. And lastly, I'd like to really thank uh, you know, my mentors, uh, Paul and Martin. So thank you very much. So I believe, off the top of my head, it's I think it's less than you know, it's a couple of millimeters. So it's that level. So that's why at this stage we're not explicitly modeling the tumor itself. Because we wanted to get high-resolution data. So what, what we're trying to do here is really 
uh, get as much information as we can to construct these models and understand what's going on, the anatomy and the different tissues. So to do that, we need to get the best data. So we tried as best as we could to get the highest resolution data. That doesn't mean that that data will be available in the clinic. So we need to, to make sure that the techniques we've developed will still work with the lower resolution data in the clinic. So that's, that's the reason why we were, we were after the high resolution. If ideally we would get as high resolution as possible, that is, that's as best as we could get within the interval available during imaging. Okay, thank you very much, Prasad. Cool. So it's now time to move to the last part of our perspective of API. So the other books, so API is now a new young adult, so like about 20 years. And a lot of things happened during the last few years. The new, new books arrived, uh, for example, uh, artificial intelligence, augmented uh, human lab with Suranga. It was uh, um, Cloud9, the commercial, commercialization aspect, and so met the Corp, and so die and Suranga, live from Singapore. Um, are going to talk about now. So we are young adults. <laughs> I can't hear you. Can you hear me, Surya? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank <laughs> So, um, so okay, everyone at API. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about this. So we both are relatively newcomers to ABI, and, um, and we probably just arrived in time for the mothership liftoff. Yeah, I mean, I have been watching the Facebook live, and it was amazing to hear the details of ABI. And now we are very excited to share some of our experience over the last three, four years, and hopefully this will kick off ABI moving into its adulthood. Yeah, so um, this is really going to be an exciting time for ABI. And what I would like to think that this is, is when it's, it's kind of like um, as ABI strikes out into the world, it's like we're a 21 year old, confident that we can really tackle anything. But first things first. So, Serena, we've been, I mean, we've been colleagues for so long, a couple of years at least. Uh, but, you know, I don't know why you joined the ABI and why you came here with. You know, you had so many other opportunities out in the world as well. 
<laughs> There's a bit of a story to that. Sometime during early uh, March 2017, I received an email from the University of Auckland that said there is an innovation and entrepreneurship program and they are looking for, for international teams who would fit into the entrepreneurial universities program. And interestingly, that email talked about the possibility of working with our exciting open bioengineering institute. At that time, as I said, I had no plans to leave Singapore, and I had just turned down an offer from Imperial College in London. However, as I was thinking through this, one of my mentors from MIT, who's a New Zealander, who knew the API, suggested that why don't I visit the API and meet the people so that I can start see. So I'm so glad that I took that advice, visited the API in June 2017. I met some of the really nice people, including Peter Hunter. Hunter. By the end of that visit, I was quite serious that you know, I should consider moving to, to ABI. And not too long ago, uh, 2018 February, my entire life was moved from Singapore to Auckland. And since, since then, it has been a wonderful ride. And, and the time just flies, but people don't notice it was really had a good time. And, and in that way, I, I see you as pretty much an ADA forever, but I just learned that you have been ADA for, for only a short period of time compared to some others. So tell me, when did you join actually and why did you join? Well, I still say that you've been here for quite a short time, but you, you also feel as if you've been here forever. You know? So, um, okay, so I think I came to ABI about four years ago, and I actually had to go and look that up. And it's, it's a bit of a blur because I really am loving it here. Peter and I started collaborating in around 2010 when I was at Industrial Research Limited, which is, our, uh, which is a predecessor for Callahan Innovation, and um, actually we've been zero plotters ever since. Um, our first collaboration was actually an MBIE bit around skin imaging, which Paul, Martin, and Andrew might remember because we were all part of it together. And then uh, one day at the break house over coffee, I'm sure, Peter and I decided that we needed to do something to grow New Zealand's medtech ecosystem and the sector. So we started the Consortium for Medical Device Technologies initially. And, um, and today, that, um, the CMBT is New Zealand's medtech research industry network, and, um, and it remains a partnership of the five founding um, universities and Callahan Innovation. Then the, the MedTech call came along, and that was in 2014, 2014-15. Uh, and, um, and that and the call has been really instrumental in developing the um, MedTech translational research capability and capacity in New Zealand, and also the research clinical relationships that underpin the MedTech ecosystem. And I was working closely with Peter and Marilyn and, and that, and then Nina came along, and so this was the nucleus of the core at ABI at the time. And, um, and I, it was, I was still at Callahan, but I made it part of my role to contribute to the core at Callahan. And then when I decided to leave for other adventures, Peter suggested I come join ABI. And so here I am, having looked back since. So, um, well, that, that's our journey, right? Uh, so, uh, another thing, you know, we have noticed is really the, the, the diversity. And, you know, not all of us are hardcore bioengineers at ABI. We are a diverse bunch of people in terms of our expertise, networks, and, and cultures. And, and I don't think you look far away. You yourself is not a, a bioengineer option, has a bioengineering background. So tell us, how do you fit in? Well, um, so I'm actually a spectroscopist by training. Um, and I specialize in, notice that ED past tense, in material structure function. But my skills would be quite rusty now, so nobody would trust me in the lab. Um, <laughs> I moved into science management really early on in my career, and I discovered a love of business and, commercial, and technology commercialization. So my background and interest provides that ability to move between the two worlds of science and business. Um, I have a wide network now and a national perspective from the work of the CMDT and the core and my, all my other things that I do. So I guess, um, to answer your question, uh, my place at API is if we were Marvel characters, I would be the connector. So I would help connect API to external stakeholders and initiatives. 
So, um, so you've got me as a label set there, so yes, I think that's cool. Um, so Serena, you're not a hardcore bioengineer either, so how do you fit into AI? Yeah, you're right, but you know, as we saw during the presentations throughout the day, AI has expanded itself into diverse capabilities. As of now, I believe we have over 25 research groups that fits into four research fields, computation and experimental physiology, medical devices and instrumentation, engineering for clinical technologies, and finally, biomimetics and augmented human technologies. So in spite of moving continents, it did not take too much time for us to be an integral part of the biomimetics and the human technology team. And we have developed a deep sense of belonging, belongingness to AI through that activity. Yeah, that's really cool. But, you know, actually talking about diversity, isn't it really interesting that a Singaporean, Sri Lankan, and a Malaysian are here representing ABI in its adulthood? I mean, it's so cool. There's so many different cultures and nationalities under one roof. And um, it brings real diversity of thought, but it also teaches us to be respectful and accepting of each other and build trust amongst different cultures. I mean, it's really good for ABI, but I think it can only make New Zealand a better place as well. Indeed, indeed, we do celebrate diversity at ABI. Also, ABI is a, is a place that we can do special things. So, Dan, tell me some of the special things that you have done and made one of the happiest moments over the last few years. Well, um, there's lots, but we'll limit it to one uh, in the essence of time. So it must be about Club 9 and setting up Club 9. So Peter has fostered innovation and nurtured spin arts from ABI right from the beginning of the Institute. And the Medtech Core has been very successful in, in translating um, in research translation. So it's seeded about 15 companies in the last five years, and a lot of this are actually out of ABI as well. So um, Cloud9 is a space dedicated to foster this new wave of um, companies that are coming through, and to me it's a natural extension of ABI's vision of growing the medtech ecosystem. It also connects up all our activities around research, training, innovation, translation, and commercialization. Um, Cloud9 is special uh, because it is the very first startup space in New Zealand dedicated solely to health tech companies. And, um, and despite what every, anyone tells you, Surya, Cloud9 is not an incubator nor an accelerator because we are no formal program. We are a nurturator. So, because we nurture companies, you know. Um, so, you know, it's really. Um, uh, so, so Cloud9 is a floor that's dedicated to research in a res uh, to business in a research institute and that's really special because it helps connect our community directly to commercial activities and show the students alternate career paths. But it's also a trusted environment where the companies can share information freely and um, it's also the, it also gives us the opportunity to mentor groups that are looking to start new commercial opportunities and um, see that out of ABI, and that really is a really unique way to grow. So from a personal standpoint, I'm really lucky to be, to be able to help create Cloud9. It's an adventure of its own, it's a little startup as well. Um, I have ideas about how to grow companies from the 10 years that I've worked for so many, but you know, we also have other people to draw on, like Simon and Tor and David, and um, Peter and ABI have now provided this opportunity to experiment and develop something meaningful with all that knowledge. So this is a very special opportunity and I don't think I could have made Cloud9 anywhere else. And um, Cloud9 is where aspirations meet ambition and dreams and I think it is the adult embodiment of the ethos of ABI. So Surya, what about you? Why is ABI special to you? Oh, and before that, that was an excellent achievement, and, and I learned a big term, nurturate. But for me, as I think some of the people said that, and you probably mentioned, I said, for me, what's special is feeling about surround, the fact that you're surrounded by special people. In India, if you think about it, it's full of wonderful people. Academics with great achievements live very much down to earth. We have administrative staff with a commitment to make our life easier. And we have passionate students 
full of mind, dream, and deep. So essentially, as I said, you are surrounded by special people, and, and that makes you, you know, able to do special things. For example, I was lucky to be part of an amazing initiative that Mark Billing has led. He joined AGI in 2018 in May June. In such a short span of time, he put together the Arrive Network, one of the largest major reality, virtual reality consortium in the world. So, this is just one example. At AGI, we have two many of these special things. What an outsider would consider a rare opportunity is business as usual at AGI. We don't see this, but that's very special. Really. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. And I think sometimes you take it for granted, but you know, over a cup of coffee or tea, it's good to reflect on how special ABI is. So we're now forced to take off. So tell me, Serena, if we did some crystal gazing, what do you see for ABI going forward? We, we did hear that we have pretty much all the, the core capabilities in terms of uh, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, from medical devices, instrumentation, modeling, experimental physiology, and engineering for clinical technologies, those core bioengineering capabilities, as well as we have machine learning capabilities, we have augmented reality virtual reality capabilities, we have human machine interface development capability, that's one side of things. We do have the, the capacity for translating our work into real products and services. We do have a wonderful network of research and industry collaborations. We have good sources of research, industry, and philanthropic funding. And more than anything, we have a wonderful leadership and supporting staff that is goes on. So in short, I think ABI is now a strong, grown-up individual. But this should be a beginning of a new era. A new era where we should be thinking really, really deep and setting ourselves to make a huge positive impact, not just locally, but globally as well. So, Dai, from your perspective, what are some of the things that you look forward to in the coming years? What's well, similar to you to some extent, I'm seeing big dreams come true. And um, as you said, ABI is poised to make really big impacts in New Zealand and globally. But I just want to dwell on two initiatives that's happening at the moment. The first is the 12 Ladies Programme, which really links together ABI's own work to, um, to understand whole body function and ultimately be used for personal, um, personalized medicine. It'll, it has major implications for healthcare everywhere. But you know, when Peter and I met, they told me about DG Need. And at that point in time, I was like, I scratched my head, it was like, okay, this is a really good idea, but how are we going to implement this? Because technology is, it hasn't caught up yet, and I should have known, right? It's just a matter of time. So now, I think time is here, so I think it's really cool. The second initiative is um, that I want to touch on is actually um, developing the National MedTech Innovation Quarter up in Grafton. Peter mentioned it earlier, the MedTech Innovation IQ. And what this will do is anchor New Zealand's activities in MedTech in one space so that people from the outside can go in and come and interact with us. And it will then give New Zealand a platform, um, a, a national, you know, New Zealand, a, a MedTech innovation and translational research platform so that we can um, attract business and research opportunities, investors and multinationals into the New Zealand ecosystem, as well as continue building the capability and capacity for New Zealand's growth. So we're really just starting on both journeys and it will be exciting to see what can be achieved. So um, Trenia, what do you think is the most important characteristics for ABI going forward that will see us successful? Wow, that's a, that's a difficult one. If I had to, to pick one, I think I would pick the culture. While you know, we are enjoying our time at API, we need to be very conscious that we won't have to play our part to preserve this wonderful culture that has been created over the years. In fact, because of this, this supportive, transparent, and caring culture, I cannot help but feel that I can count on it during good times as well as 
challenging times like this with the pandemic and everything. I'm sure you all have that feeling. So, isn't that an immensely wonderful feeling to have? Yes, it, it is. And I think we should really treasure it going forward. And so with that, everyone, um, during and I close this session, we, found, we, we have had an exciting 20 years that built the foundation of ABI as a world leading research institute. And we've taken our place internationally in science and showed our leadership in national initiatives. So we need to harness that magic that fueled these last 20 years to take us through to the next 20 years and beyond. And that magic is good, kind, and strong leadership. Sprinkle amongst a community that is caring, has integrity, and steep in deep ethics. So these are the personality pillars of ABI from in adulthood from Sarah and I. So with this, we hope that you have some food for thought and have a think about that as we go forward. Thank you. So welcome um, to our award ceremony. Um, It'll come back. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. So the uh, first thing to, to do today is to recognise that um, last year was pretty tough for all of us, wasn't it? With, with the COVID lockdown and um, the challenges that that posed to us as an institute, and um, I think we all need to um, uh, give ourselves sort of a round of applause and a pat on the back for the way that the API students and staff coped with the COVID lockdowns that we um, hopefully are not going to have any more of and, and, and for finding our way through this, this very difficult time. So uh, please, uh, let's start with that. So this, this, is, um, this ceremony is meant to, is for us to celebrate the excellence of the things that we do and, and in particular the things that were done in 2020. So we're going to go through these different awards, starting with the Professional Staff Excellence Award, the awards rec recognising the excellence of the presentations and posters we've seen today, and then some other research related awards. Now the first two categories were not decided by the research committee, whose names are at the bottom, but they did choose the last three categories. I think the Professional Staff Excellence Award was uh, decided upon by the executive team of the ABI and the Student and Postdoc Awards by the, uh, the I don't know, come on. There's a group of people <laughs> wandering around. So, um, first of all, um, 
the ABI is, is you can think of us as like a black box. We're a machine that does stuff. And the things that go into it are funding, and we heard a little bit about that from Peter this morning, and people, students, they're the inputs. And then out the other end comes knowledge and expertise and publications and educated and skilled and mature graduates. But in the middle is all the stuff, the staff, and, and that includes professional staff and academic staff. So we're going to celebrate some of the excellence of those people as well. And so I'd like to start with um, the Professional Staff Award, which is, this is the first year we've offered this award, I think. And it's, it's appropriate, uh, particularly given the last 12 months, that we um, offer this award to people within our professional staff who have made an outstanding contribution um, in the last 12 months. So if you see your photograph come up on the screen now, but first let me say all of our professional staff, and we know really our technical IT, the administrative people, um, and anyone else on the professional staff um, are thoroughly deserving of our thanks for the assistance that they give us in keeping this place a good place to live and work. So I want to recognize everyone, but if you see your photograph, would you just please come down to the front for um, special mention. Um, so these four individuals in particular, please come down if you're here, and I know you are Matt, and I can see some movement up the top there. And uh, please come down. Um, so Nina has nominated these four in particular, and I'm sure she would agree with me that all of our administrative staff are worthy of, of, um, uh, of, of this recognition. But these four individuals in particular did an outstanding job at helping Nina and the rest of us deal with the challenges of COVID. And um, in fact, so much so that uh, Nina also <laughs> is the recipient of this award for the outstanding work that she did in, in guiding us all through the challenges of COVID. So let's again celebrate this. and outputs coming from the other end. Peter's presented some of this data, but I get to, I present slightly alternative facts to Peter. Um, I'm gonna talk about the inputs to the ABI machine, where my accounting method is slightly different from Peter's, but this is what the numbers look like to me. So this is the input into the machine. This is the dollars coming in the door that helps us to do the things that we do as researchers. So in 2015, this is where things were. We had the three categories of income here. There's student training income, that's the orange bit at the bottom, about four million, three million a year, uh, up to research income that was at about 12 million, and then you add those two together and it doesn't quite match my focus, so I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> <It's just laughs> <long. laughs> <laughs> alternative facts, as I said. <laughs> As we go on, I better just notice that, by the way. As we go on through the years, we notice the income goes up, and this is fantastic. So in about 2017, 2018, bang, a big rocket of income went up uh, from banks to, I think, IDG, and other various large grants that came in at that time. And here we are in 2020. Uh, 2021 is, is, is also going to be a good year for us. So our income now, our total income, uh, from the sources that I'm accruing here, which are really research income, this is, you can think of this as the amount of money that the taxpayer has invested in us 
to do the things that we do. All right, so this is New Zealanders mostly, some people from overseas, but mostly New Zealanders investing in us. $26 million in 2020. That's a lot of money. What do we do with it? So here's the outputs over the same period of time. Now, what are our general outputs? Well, I'm, I'm looking here only at journal articles, conference proceedings, book chapters, and patents. So these are the tangible sort of products of doing research. What do they look like? So in about 2015, we, we produced about 300 and something uh, outputs, of which roughly half were journal articles. So let's continue to look at this number over the years. Okay, interesting, eh? Now last year, of course, was challenging because the, the orange bit is smaller, because fewer of us were able to present our work at conferences. Conference proceedings were lower, but journal articles remained relatively static over that same period of time. So that gives us pause for reflection. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we produced 260 research outputs in the last 12 months. These are unique research outputs. So um, that's something I think that we can feel very proud and happy about. And I'll leave you to think about why it is, perhaps, that outputs are not immediately following the inputs to the machine, which is dollars. And that's hardly, that's a system identification, so we can go off on system identification. So you take a system and you put stuff in and you can perturb the input and you can figure out the system function and maybe there's a delay in the system function. <laughs> Somebody can do some system ID on this, but I think it's interesting to look at. Let's look at students over the same area, same period of time, graduate students, uh, masters in orange and PhDs in blue relatively consistent over those periods, over those years. So now we get to the really interesting bit. What is our research sensitivity? <laughs> this is the cool stuff. Research income, take all of our research income and divide it by the number of research outputs to find out how sensitive we are as a machine. $26 million in the door, 260 publications out the door, each publication that we have produced, journal articles, conference proceedings, patents, has cost the taxpayer $100,000. <laughs> now, of course, we do other things as well, but this is roughly right. Because that $26 million that's come into our coffers in the last 12 months is intended for us to produce these outputs. That's about the equivalent of one kilogram of gold. <laughs> And that's, quite seriously, that's, that's how, the value of each research output that we have produced. That is the cost of it. The value might be even way higher. So I have prepared a, a kilogram of gold, which I'll pass around for you. That is, uh, you, you can feel it, it's quite weighty, that's one kilogram. That is the size, that's what one kilogram of gold looks like. So there you go, you can pass that around. Peace, <laughs> <laughs> that is not your prize, by the way. <laughs> I want us to think, I'm doing this because I want us to think about the value of each bit of academic knowledge that we gain as researchers and how valuable that is and how we owe it to our funders <laughs> to get these outputs into the community so they have an impact. Okay, that's enough of my preaching. Um, I now want to. I've really taken up time here, which is fun. Um, I, want to, I want to go back to what we mentioned this morning about $24 million of new grants in 2020. That's quite astounding. Um, and I've had to use a logarithmic scale to show them all, um, as you'll see here, because of our, our wonderful director bringing in a $15 million grant that is funding this institute uh, to a large extent for, for another five years. So a log scale is required to show Peter's grant, which of course represents, as he would very humbly point out, the work of many of the principal investigators in the ADI. Here are the others that have come in within the last 12 months. All of these people deserve a thorough round of applause, particularly before you do so, I want to point out the red ones here, which are the two Marsden grants to Peng Du and Kelly Burrows, and, and collaborators, of course, and to Tim. Angela Gordon, who won the very prestigious Madison grants in the last 12 months. Bunches of HRC related grants. SIFTI grants, the guys who won SIFTI grants, fantastic. Sam, Ted, Amit, and Marco. 
um, Leo and others bringing in uh, income from overseas, uh, down to Joseph, who looks like Leo, poor Joseph. He, he brought in $10,000. Well done, Joseph. Uh, <laughs> he continuing to bring in money and, and you're also um, obviously deeply appreciated. These are the ones that were awarded in the last 12 months. So well done everyone. Okay, so now to, um, oh, I wasn't going to do this yet, I was going to do now, I'm going to do the um, student awards so uh, you can get this out of the way. So first we're going to recognise um, the three minutes thesis uh, presentations that were done today. Some really entertaining stuff, really good to get an overview of um, the, the work that's been done around the ADI. So we've got two second place prize winners for the three minute thesis, thesis uh, presentations. The first of these goes to Christine Sy. Well, Christine's coming down from the front. I'd ask you to please be joined by Sarah. So both Christine and Sarah were, were chosen by the um, committee as, as being very highly commendable. They are the second place winners of the three minute thesis competition. <laughs> students. The first is our runner-up. There is only one runner-up in this, this uh, category, Debbie Zhao. Stand up so we can applaud them. <laughs> Hamid Abbasi, where is Hamid? <laughs> Hamid, the committee asked me to commend you for, for presenting the most innovative poster. Thank you. Well done. Uh, and, and the, um, well, this one just gets the runner up <laughs> award, but this is worthy of an honourable mention, and that's um, Prasad. Thurinder Prasad, the Horenda Gamaga. Person, uh, oh, incidentally, I think you know, these all have little cards that are going to be collectible from admin at some point for with prize money on them. 
they're not here today, but please go to talk to Nina to collect your prizes afterwards. Uh, this is the best post office poster. Well done, Marco Schneider. That's a really tough one because we all we've published 160 journal articles and another 150 conference proceedings in the last year. It's very difficult to distill these down to two outputs or, or one output. Um, but we didn't ask anybody to nominate their excellent papers and we received some nominations and I'm going to present two of these to you just briefly. And we're looking here for um, papers that have quality and impact either in the novelty of what's being presented, the quality of the journal, in the review of comments, etc. So the first of these is uh, this manuscript in Scientific Reports, which is a nature.com journal, um, and this has been uh, published by um, people from the Assembly for the Lung Group, Maha, and Alice and Harry and Merrin and, and collaborators. So um, this paper is one in which they um, they examine the, the shape of the lungs using um, the sort of modeling techniques that we're used to in the ABI and shape analysis techniques and find that uh, um, the differences that emerge in shape um, come with age um, but not with sex. So the lung changes in shape with age but not with sex, not between the two, the two male and female genes. Um, and the reviewer said, well done in that case. <laughs> that was a nice comment. Uh, it provides a useful baseline for understanding lung shape changes with disease, and the results are important. So please applaud with me uh, their paper, which is an excellent. Thank you. <laughs> and the second finalist uh, for the ABI Best Paper Award of 20. 20 is this manuscript from Samuel Schlatter, who many of you will remember, and Samuel will say, um, called Inkjet Printing and Complex Soft Machines with Densely Integrated Electrostatic Actuators. This is a, a, a manuscript in which they use inkjet printing to directly print uh, devices that can be actuated using piezoelectric uh, type approaches um, using a additive manufacturing 3D printing technology. Wonderful manuscript, it's all done in soft materials, so it's a soft actuator. Uh, it was on the journal editors list and featured in advanced science news. Um, congratulations uh, on this, this wonderful paper, um, Samuel Rosé and colleagues. Research committee, or a subset of the research committee, read through these papers and, and assessed them both. And, and while both are excellent pieces of work, it can be the only one. And so the prize for the best published paper for 2020 goes to Samuel Rosset. Here, I can, can I please um, invite you to applaud him also for being, um, according to my analysis, the researcher, let me get this right, the researcher in the ABI whose papers published between 2015 and 2020 have received the most citations. Okay, so the next award category is um, 
an award for ex excellence in research translation. And here we're looking to recognize those who have taken work that's been done in the, in the institute and translated it somehow, either into clinical practice, commercialization, or societal impact. And uh, this year, um, we received a nomination for a project. You remember last year, it was um, we had two nominees. We had the breast group, and we saw what they were doing in, in um, Prasad's talk. And we had muspets from the um, Namibia Kari, uh, yeah, the AH lab. Um, this year, we have one award to give to an excellent body of work that's um, had a good deal of societal impact. And I'm just going to go straight to it. It's Project Curious. So um, please, anyone who is here, Serena is uh, hopefully still on Zoom. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> 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 uh, can I ask anybody else from this team, or anyone from Serena's lab, to please just come down the front? We want to celebrate the absolute excellence. <laughs> see me, but um, I'm, imagine I'm holding up your prize. We're, we're um, fantastically proud of what you had achieved in this project. Let me see if I can pull it up. If you haven't seen the Curious website and what this is all about, uh, let me see if I can show you. So, um, Serena and team, um, and the team is, is a bunch of people that was on that photo, have created a suite of sensors that have been distributed and made available to school children throughout New Zealand. It's a fantastic initiative to get real measurement devices into the hands of school children um, so that they can explore and measure and um, quantify, which is um, an excellent initiative to try and support uh, teachers and their students to uh, grapple with the STEM subjects and, and develop a passion for STEM. And so uh, I think if you go to the Curious website, it's, it's spelled K-I-W-R-I-O-U-S dot com. And you'll see the marvelous materials that are online here. Uh, they, of course, won a, an award uh, from the university, and uh, somewhere around here we'll find it. And here we go. Oh, that's the same photo. Well, you can go, oh, Will, you could have come down to collect it. <laughs> Will Charles is in the photo as well. Uh, so, a wonderful initiative that I think deserves our applause and, and uh, will have and has already had societal impact. So, well done, Sir and the people. And I have one final award to give out, um, and that is, oops, let me just kill this. So. Okay, excellence in graduate supervision. So, of course, one of the other major activities of the ABI is in training people. And that requires a, um, a set of skills that are, um, we sort of exemplified last year in the Professor Nash's uh, award of this um, prize. And we're recognizing here the extent and range of the supervisor's activities, the um, relationship and rapport they have with their students, the positive outcomes that that produces, respect, etc and career development and the opportunities that um, they put into this activity and, uh, and what they do across the university as well. And uh, we received an excellent nomination, which I'm very pleased to announce uh, this week, this year has been go to Associate Professor Saranga Naniyakara. Um, and let me first, before we applaud Saranga, who we can't see, but I know we know is there. Um, <laughs> This is what um, has been said about Surana's supervision. And these are just a subset of the quotes. We're going to make available the full document that, um, that documents uh, Surana's excellence at graduate supervision. Um, uh, but this is what he has been um, uh, referred to, how he's been referred to by his collaborator, Dawn Garbett, who is one of the people involved in Curious. It's a privilege to support Surana's submission. Uh, for excellence in supervision. I've been fortunate to be included in his family, AH Lab family. I've seen self firsthand the respect his team of postdocs and graduates has for him, the diverse skills and a bit of capacity and motivation of his team. 
to make the technology work for humans, to share their ideas, and to make their innovations readily accessible is truly impressive, she says. And Serena provides the energy, determination, and commitment behind every individual and team effort. Um, secondly, uh, another, another um, testimonial from one of the students, Don Sunita Serena clearly goes, oh, very well. <laughs> Welcome back. Um, the, uh, uh, in this testimony, it says that uh, I think I've got time during my PhD, and well, that's saying something. <laughs> Serena is the most energetic person I've ever seen, and he surely radiates this energy to his students. All of the students are hard working, not because we are told to do so, but from seeing how Serena works. He is inspirational. Uh, and then uh, three other comments. Over the four years of knowing Serena, I've come to view him almost as family. He would invite us, that is the lab, to his home to celebrate achievements with him and his family. He would emphasize the importance of taking time to relax and to get to know other members by socializing, leading us on annual lab trips there, lunch and coffee chats, there's coffee again. Reflecting back on all of these moments, I believe his dedication to mentorship and his character have been inspiring and pivotal to my academic, personal, and professional development through my studies. I'm sure the same can be said by past and present students. Another comment, um, I've had the opportunity to be his teaching assistant and facilitator for workshops and design thinking and have marveled at how he finds time and energy to be as consistently creative as and inspiring as he is. In these classes and workshops, I've seen him to be a wonderful mentor, offering criticism with kindness and respect, gently nudging the students to think out of the box. So um, please join with me. I, I wish I could bring your face up here, Serena. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So all of us here are applauding you for the, uh, the wonderful example that you have shown of how to supervise students well, and there's no better measure of that than the feedback from the students. So congratulations from us all. We're very proud of you.